it's 10 o'clock. Um, I think we can start. Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to the ALM Ready Business Roadshow, um, designed to showcase investment and business opportunities for investors looking to invest in Nigeria. Within the ALM network, uh, which will be introduced very shortly, uh, we'll have the Kenya edition of the Roadshow, the Tanzania edition, and today we're having the Nigeria edition. Um, on this webinar, we have brought together industry leaders and key players across various sectors of the Nigerian economy to discuss investment and business opportunities in Nigeria. Um, they will discuss the extent of Nigeria's business opportunities in key sectors and the steps investors can take to translate them into profitable and sustainable businesses within the country's legal framework. To begin, uh, we will introduce the chairman of the management board of Alipan Oyebodi, ALM Nigeria, to give the introductory remarks, Mrs. Fofudosokun. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure today to welcome you to the African Legal Network Ready Business Show, Roadshow. Today focuses on Nigeria. Uh, like Goke said in his introductory remarks, we've had a roadshow in Kenya and in Tanzania. So this is the third of the series. I think generally uh, we as a continent, and I mean we in the private sector, have left a lot to government over the years to attract and sell the African story. It is clear that the African leaders over the years have not done a great job in selling the potential of the African continent and the market, either through lack of political will or selfish interest to mention a few. And I'm sure a lot of that discussion is going to come up during the sessions. The current global economic land hardship has given Africa a wake up call. There are no free handouts as all our continents are battling with their own various issues ranging from political instability to high inflation, to recession, to war, causing a negative ripple effect at globally. So the ALN Ready Business Series is our contribution promoting awareness to the vast business opportunities in Africa. And I think Karim will be speaking more about the network after me. So the Nigerian Roadshow also coincides with the Nigerian Economic Summit, which started yesterday. And some of our distinguished panelists and speakers today also played a key role yesterday. The president, as well as the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Economy, CBN Governor, uh, and very important government functionaries, right, engage in very frank discussions with the with industrialists, with the public, with the financial sector. And the reality of our lives today is that we have embarked on a journey which is brave and bold. To mention a few, a lot of people are conversant with things that have been happening since the new administration. Removal of petroleum subsidy, which over the years had engulfed trillions of naira. Just to mention a few figures, in 2021 alone, 1.57 trillion, well, that's the record, was spent on petroleum subsidy. From January to May 2022, it's recorded that 1.27 trillion was spent on petroleum subsidy. Since this government, we've also seen removal of arbitrage and the reintroduction of the foreign exchange autonomous market, which has seen the Naira depreciate. So what's the end result? The journey will be bumpy for Nigerians in the near term, but the fundamentals remain. The government says Nigeria is open for business. 
with a current GDP of $477 billion. Nigeria is Africa's largest economy and is poised for rapid growth. Of course, we have to get it right. It is too large and strategic to ignore. Yesterday, there was a report by Goldman Sachs circulating, which forecasts that by 2075, Nigeria is set to become one of the top economies globally. Globally, Nigeria is key because of its young, expanding population, wealth of natural resources, booming tech sector, and dedication to economic change. That is one fresher that this government has brought in. Our distinguished panelists today will navigate you through Nigeria's foreign exchange laws, challenges and mitigating actions, opportunities in the public-private sector, capital market issues and opportunities, and the fintech space, to mention a few. I know the sessions today will be frank, informative, and engaging. Our contributors here will not, our contributions today will not be stored away but we will engage and challenge the government of the day to deliver on its promise, Nigeria is open for business. Before I close my opening remarks, we must emphasize the importance of collaboration with the private sector and charge the government to deliver on transparency and integrity. It has to be a two-way traffic. The president yesterday assured investors that the government will honor all legitimate effects forwards I'm sure that is music to the ears of a lot of bankers today and going forward. Remember, Nigeria has been this way before. Remember those who were, at least who were old enough at the time, we had what we call the structural adjustment program. We've come a long way from there. We've had our highs and lows. But the reality is that with consistent policies, strong leadership, Nigeria definitely with corroboration from the private sector, will attain its position as one of the top economies globally. At that point, I will hand over to the next speaker. Thank you and have an engaging session this morning. Thank you very much, Mrs. Dosekman. Um, we'll move on very quickly to the next um, item, which will be to introduce Ms. Rosa Nduata Motero, um to give us a brief you know uh background and understanding about the ALN network that Mrs. Doss and I have spoken about before now. Ms. Rosa Duata Motero, please. Thank you very much. And um, it's afternoon here in Nairobi. So allow me to say good afternoon to those who are joining us from uh, regions where it's afternoon and good morning um, to all of you. So as I've been introduced, my name is Rosa Ndwati Montero and I'm the managing partner of ALN Kenya, Anjao Allen Kana, and I'm today representing ALN. First, I would like to thank and congratulate our sister firm, Aluko and Oyedebo for arranging um, this ALN Ready Business Roadshow. It's a pleasure for me to be speaking to all of you, and I look forward to the discussions that we will be having um, uh, today. Let me start with uh, talking a bit about uh, ALN. So ALN was established in 2004 and has today become the largest and most integrated alliance of corporate law firms across Africa. We cover North, South, West, and East Africa. And we have our shared vision, uh, ethos and expertise um, that allows us to be able to speak with one voice in what we now fondly call connecting the dots for Africa. Louder. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, please, we can hear you. Okay, I thought someone had made a comment, but no worries. Um, so what I was talking about is our shared vision, our ethos uh, and expertise 
which allows us to be able to speak with one voice as we connect the dots for the African continent. We are one place where we have a common goal of achieving outstanding solutions for our clients, wherever they want to do business in Africa. As ALN, we have continuously promoted Africa as an investment destination through the years. And um, like Kofo has said, this is not something that can be left to governments alone. We in private sector have to make sure that we can um, do our part and in fact, pull our weight in making sure that um, we continue business on our continent. So the ALN Ready Business Roadshow supports initiatives that showcase the investment and business opportunities in the major economies that we have and where we as ALN are, are present. It continues to be a very effective platform um, to ensure dialogue, and most importantly, a candid overview of opportunities, challenges, risks, and rewards of investing and doing business in Africa. The beauty about it is that we don't need to sugarcoat the continent. Neither do we need to go on the opposite side and show a collapsing continent. We can speak the truth because we are in the continent. So we have for decades now been trying to foster intelligent conversations about the continent continent while creating a balanced picture of the investment climate on our continent. The roadshow is a further testament to ALN's understanding of the trends and events shaping the continent, combined with our entrepreneurial spirit, making us trusted legal advisors to global and continental clients looking to invest in Africa. So today, we'll also be launching the Nigeria Investment Guide. And what ALN has done which a lot of our clients have given us feedback and said is, is very helpful, is to um, publish an investment guide that helps you to understand each country, country by country, um, what is happening and how to do business in, in, in that country. With a, a quick read, you can be able to understand what's happening um, without being even on the ground. But this information is being provided by the top law firms uh, in each of those jurisdictions. So with the investment grind, we are hoping that we can grow the catalog of country-specific investment guides that we have published so far. These guides are thoughtful aids that will help you to navigate the many opportunities and show you where the risks are. And once you've understood the risks, you'll be able to understand where to get the rewards that are available. For the Nigeria Investment Guide, that will help you with Nigeria, as well as just understanding the context of the Africa continent in general. As I've said, our mission as ALN is to connect ideas. We want to connect people and we want to connect the continent. We know that in the current investment climate, and Kofo spoke about this, there are a lot of global headwinds and challenges. And so there's a lot of um, defensiveness and risk averse uh, positions that can be taken. So what we are trying to, to do then is to rethink the continent's potential for long-term future investment and business opportunities so that African countries can begin to diversify their economies beyond the traditional sectors that they have had and to ensure that we can look at the opportunity that presents itself with the fact that there's been a lot of global um, disruptions. So for Nigeria itself, as you've heard, it has a very dynamic economy. And I know for many of you, you're living in that economy and you're aware. And so we're very proud to be able to showcase how doing business in Nigeria can even go further. When you look at the dynamic economy, um, energy and natural resources, financial services, real estate and construction, technology and mining, all our vital importance to this very important economy on the continent. One of the areas that um, my, I myself sitting in Nairobi are very proud of is the startup ecosystem that is being developed across the continent between Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa. We are priding ourselves for being the hubs for startups. And with this, um, it can then help to spur even other economic growth. So as one of the key economic hubs in Africa, Nigeria's investment potential and business environment gives investors the ability and opportunity to venture into other African economies. And this is exactly why we, what we try to foster by having ALN in place, that you can start your business in Nigeria and then expand it to other countries um, across the continent, however you'd like to do it based on the dynamics of the industry that you are serving. So as ALN, our commitment is continue to promote Africa 
uh, as an investment destination of choice by creating platforms such as the ALN Ready Business Roadshow, which supports initiatives to showcase the investment and business opportunities in the major economies where we are present. So we are looking forward to the discussions today. And when we finish the discussions today, we'll be um, proceeding to each of the other African countries. Like has been explained, this is already our third um, roadshow. And we have presence in 15 countries in Africa, and we also have an office in Dubai. And so we look forward to having the rest of you join us as ALN as we go around the continent understanding how to do business. For now, I want to wish you very good discussions as we interact and engage, and engage in doing business in Nigeria. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nduata Moto. Uh, Mrs. Dostoko had set the tone by giving introductions. Uh, Ms. Nduata Motero has introduced the ALN Network slash Alliance. And the scene for the discussions on the business roadshow today will be set by Mr. Bolaji Balogun. Mr. Bolaji Balogun, or BB as is fondly known, is the Chief Executive Officer of Chapel Hill Denham, Nigeria's leading investment bank, which he founded in 2005. The Chapel Hill Denham is also the leading alternative assets manager focused on areas accretive to Nigeria and Africa's development, and the Chief Investment Officer of the Nigeria Infrastructure Debt Fund, which is the first listed infrastructure debt fund in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa. He has over 34 years of experience in investment banking, investing in mobile telecommunication. He spent over 10 years with, within the FCMB group, after which stint he left to be a co-founder and director of Econet Wireless Nigeria, now Airtel Nigeria. He led the capital raising and license bid auction for Econet Wireless Nigeria's mobile license. The 1.67 billion US dollar sale of Econet Wireless to Celtel in 2005 remains Nigeria's single largest successfully exited private investment. Mr. Balogun is a board member of the United Nations Global Compact and is the co-chair of the Private Sector Advisory Group on the SDGs. He's also the chairman of Endeavor Nigeria and a director of Trust Fund Pensions, one of Nigeria's largest pension fund managers. He was immediate past chairman of Lafarge Africa PLC. He's also a member of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Africa Advisory Board, Mr. Bolaji Balogun is an economics graduate from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Before I hand over to him, um, may I also add that he is one of the lions in the lions den, the world's number one reality business show, which is now in Nigeria. I think there is no you know, better person to set the tone or the same for today's discussions. And I will hand over to Mr. Bolaji Balogun. Thank you very much, Goke, and good morning, everyone. I wonder if I, I could share just two slides. Would you give me permission to share? Yes, please, you can. Thank you very much. I wonder if you can all see my slides. Yes, we can. Great. So let me start first and foremost by thanking Aluko Anoyebode for inviting me to speak, you know, at this ALN event and, and also the wider ALN network um, for giving me this opportunity. Um, and when you think about Nigeria's opportunity, I think it's always important to try and situate it, you know, within the context of Africa. And I was really pleased, you know, when Mrs. Dosekun started this morning. And, and she started coincidentally, you know, with the research and one of the two slides that I was going to use. And I genuinely believe that demography is destiny. And, you know, there's something really, really interesting about this research that Goldman Sachs you know, have done, which, you know, I think is important that we all begin to pay attention to. Um, and 
if you roll back to um, the end of the 80s, which was just about the time, you know, that I was graduating from university, and you looked at the countries of the EU, if you put that entire block together as an economic block, then to a large extent, you would have understood the trends that happened over the next 20 to 30 years. Back then, if you put all of those countries together, you would have seen very, very clearly that the countries of the EU were already the fourth largest trading bloc in the world, if you combine them as one. And I think that this Africa free trade zone opportunity that we have um, creates an incredible opportunity for Africa's largest economy, which is Nigeria. And Goldman's, I think, have captured it quite interestingly. If you take all of the countries, you know, in Africa and Nigeria being the most significant one, and you put them together as one economic trading block, then what will shock each and every one of you is that first and foremost, um, that trading block will be the fourth largest trading block in the world by 2075, and it will be one and a half times the size of Europe today. What's not as surprising is that that trading block will be 33% of the world's population at that time. And the biggest driver, the biggest engine in that trading block is Nigeria, which on a standalone basis um, would be the sixth largest economy in the world by 2075, just behind Indonesia. Now, what is quite interesting is when you think about the dynamics of all of the countries that are larger, all of them have significantly aging populations. Nigeria today has an average population of 18 years and nine months. So in 2075, you know, that population um, is just you know, to a large extent coming out of their prime. Most of Nigeria's population at that time will be a significant component of more importantly, Africa's working population. And if you study the economic history of the last 30 years and you study the growth of China, you study the growth of India and the impacts that really strong but young demography has had. Um, you might agree with me that demography indeed, you know, can be destiny. I'm going to touch briefly on one last slide about Africa and then I'm going to focus on Nigeria. And often when people think about the continent, they really have no conception for the scale of the opportunity on the continent. Um, it's first and foremost, from a geographic scale, quite large, and it's 54 different countries, whereas many investors tend to look at it and think of it, you know, as one. Um, it's three times larger than Europe, the US and China. I'm not sure many people really think about that. When you and I look at you know, modern day maps, um, you might even think that Greenland is larger, whereas Africa is 14 times the size of Greenland. But when you then dig deeper, you'll find that the continent holds about 30% of the world's mineral reserves, and we all know about its oil and gas. But more importantly, about 85% of the world's metals that are critical um, for the energy transition sit in this continent, and they sit in the middle of the continent. DRC obviously being the most blessed, but even countries like Nigeria, 
have very, very significant resources, you know, and deposits, you know, of lithium and all of the other EV metals. And that's going to be important for the world over the next 30 years as we move towards the energy transition. Many people think about Nigeria fundamentally as an oil and gas economy. But I think we all miss the incredible blessing that this country has. And it's really a country that has three other segments that are very, very significant and which people fairly, you know, rarely focus on. Um, number one, um, Nigeria is fundamentally an agricultural and farming country, which if it were to make the needed investments in power and transportation and cold chain networks, has the ability not only to deliver its own food security, but also feed this continent. And more importantly, it also has the incredible ability to feed the world. It's also a country of tremendous mineral deposits. And very, very few people really understand our mineral blessing because for too long, we've all been focused on oil and gas. And again, if we could make the infrastructural investments in power and in transportation networks, um, Nigeria again has significant solid mineral reserves quite apart from its incredible blessing of oil and even bigger, its natural gas. But by far, and this would be the last, you know, comments that I would make, by far the most significant blessing that Nigeria has is an incredible talent economy. And that talent economy starts from what um, the CEO of the ALN um, Kenya Business has already talked about, Rosa, um, which is an incredible blessing on the technology side with all that's happening in the startup industry, but an even bigger blessing on the creative industry side with all that's happening with our music, our film, our art, and even our creative writing. And when you then overlay on that our incredible blessing of sports talent, then you begin to recognize the scale of the opportunity here that perhaps in all of the near-term difficulties, we don't all see. I very often sit and I say to young people in the firm that if they understood these issues as well as some of us do. Um, they wouldn't be getting on a plane and trying to go somewhere like Canada because everything that they're going to look for in those places, I truly believe um, can be built here over the next 50 years. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words um, and I shouldn't hog the whole day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Balogo, for the insight on accessing the Africa and Nigerian market. Next up, next up is the first panel session themed understanding investment promotion, facilitation and incentives in Nigeria, an investor's guide. This session will be moderated by Ms. Olubumi Fayoku, a senior partner, member of the management board, and the partner in charge of the Capital Markets and Mergers and Acquisitions Practice Group, ALN Nigeria, Alukwano Yebodi. You're muted, Ma. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first ALN Business Roadshow, ALN Ready Business Roadshow. We have with us this morning a, a distinguished panel of three industry experts 
who will share their insights with us today on Nigeria as an investment destination and the practicalities of doing business in Nigeria. In particular, the panel will discuss investment promotion, facilitation and incentives in Nigeria with a view to providing guidance on the some, sometimes complex Nigerian investment terrain. I will, I will start, I will, I'm now going to introduce the three panelists. I'll start with uh, Mr. Olusei Kumapai. Mr. Olusei Kumapai is a highly accomplished and results-driven professional. He has over 25 years of banking experience across finance, strategy, risk management, and treasury. He's the executive director African subsidiaries of Access Bank PLC, one of the systemically important banks in Nigeria. Prior to his appointment as ED African subsidiaries, Mr. Shei Kumapai was the Group Chief Financial Officer of Access Bank. Good morning, Shei. It's a pleasure to have you in our midst. Bumi. The next panelist Bumi. I will Bumi. introduce is Yewande Sadiku. She's the Head of Investment Banking International Standard Bank Group. Yewande is currently responsible for Standard Bank's investment banking business outside Africa. She's an experienced investment banker and former public servant with almost three decades of experience and a strong track record of high performance and principled leadership. From 2016 to 2021, she was the executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, where she worked on institutional reforms in that strategic investment promotion and embedding a culture of governance and proactive accountability. Good morning, Yewande. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Morning, all. The third panelist with us today is Oyinda Mola Oyedunto. She's the head of legal and compliance and company secretary of Hairs Energies. Oyinda Mola has over 15 years of professional experience in corporate commercial legal practice with a focus on energy governance and compliance and mergers and acquisitions. Oyinda Mola has worked for and advised businesses in various sectors, including banking, and financial services, healthcare, real estate, power and oil and gas, um, telecommunications, FMCG, information technology, and philanthropy, both locally and internationally. Oyinda Mola previously worked with Aluko and Oyibode, and some of that impressive experience was gained during her stint with us. Good morning, Oyinda Mola. Good morning, Mr. Great to have you with us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll dive straight into it. And um, the first question is going to be directed towards Shi. Um, Shi, could you provide insight on the role of banks and financial institutions in promoting investment and improving in investment, investor confidence in Nigeria? Th th thank you, Bumi. Uh, thank you to the um, ALM family for inviting me to be part of this seminar. Uh, I see that um, you've been moving around many of my countries in Africa, so I think I'll be joining. I'll be joining uh, as as we move around. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, you know in every economy, um, banks and FIs are really the engine of growth, uh, and economic policies are transmitted, you know, to, 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 um, to um, through them. And if you look at most economies that you see in the world, uh, kind of reflect. Um, the banking system. So if you have large economies, typically you have very large banks. And the reason is that, first of all, the capital allocation mechanism, all right, depends on the bank. Uh, how do you mobilize deposits? Um, how do you generate savings to then, you know, get put into the uh, into into lending? Uh, traditionally, as you know, um, in, or simplistically, a bank, you know, takes money from the um, excess sector and then you know kind of distribute into the into and that that primary role is still there so number one is around you know we ensure that capital is allocated you know for development uh, of the economy and all the sectors of the economy i think the second thing that we do is around um because the business of banking is also about risk management we do provide uh bank and fi provide so insurance companies uh, provide you know risk management services uh, we advise our clients, if you don't do this, do that. And if you want to do it, these are the type of um, edge you should do 
So we pro you provide advisory uh, so that we can protect the investor because you don't want a customer, oh, you didn't tell me this, you didn't, I wasn't advised of this. So we, we also ensure that we, we do that. The, another thing that we do is that, you know, the industry also ensures that there is some type of um, market liquidity maker. Um, when there is uh, excess liquidity with more petrol, when it's short, we provide it to the industry so that we can continue um, to oil the system of growth. You don't want to go to the market and you're looking for money you can't find. You want to create, you want to find uh, that happen. Also, what you also find is that even um, um, when you look at the investment man, investment banks, when they do transactions, part of it will create a great underwriting to ensure that there is a market to be made in that in that in, in, in that in that in that security. What you also do is that say we um, is a very regulated industry um, everywhere in the world because it's depositors' money that 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 we we, we play with in the banks. Um, so you have the Central Bank of Nigeria that looks at banks. You have SEC for investment. You have NDIC that looks at uh, deposit insurance and all this. Um, bodies ensures that you know uh, gives investor confidence that the industry is well and alive, that things are uh, that uh, and also even the way we our disclosures that we make, you know what type of what are we doing, what products are we selling, where are we making money from, what type of risk you know are we taking to generate profit. So all of these things is very important to 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 to, to the investor. Uh, also, is around innovation and technology, and I think you know. Uh, but I just spoke to it around the fact that Nigeria, uh, South Africa, and Kenya have been here, and I think the banking industry is following suit. We're also ensuring that say, we provide access you know, for our customers to be able to do transactions digitally. Um, I mean, we have many, many channels today that you truly don't, I mean, if you look at where we are today, from banking services in terms of how it is provided, in terms of delivery, it's completely different from where we are today. All right, literally you can do everything from your phone. Uh, you can do everything from your internet banking. You can do a lot of things from your ATM that you use. So there's a lot of technology innovation that the bank is bringing to provide access uh, to get more people into the market, as well as financial inclusion. Um, I mean, one of the things, one of the, um, if you look at Africa, for instance, we have about 1.3 billion people. Out of that, about 300 million is financially excluded. And one of one of the uh, mantra is that we need to increase financial inclusion across Africa. And that's why a lot of the things that you see that we do is meant to support because if people are financially inclu included, then you know it allows it creates uh, some type of capital to be able to lend, and therefore that that's very important. The other thing that we also do to create investment is um, we provide access to global markets um, because there is trade, and I think we spoke about, about and I think we're going to, there is trade now. Trade requires um, if you if if you are importing from another country, you need a bank to help you in that in that process to to intermediate for you. So part of what we do is that we bring, we, we bring because of our relationship with correspondent banks, with a lot of DFIs, we, we help our customers access the market, access liquidity, access capital that sometimes not be, be able to be able to. So these are some of the things that we do. And lastly, we also do investor education. We want the investors to understand what are we doing? Um, how is the market? Um, what's happening? What's the economy looking like? These are the products we invest. This is the uh, this is this is the um, this is the channels of complaint. Um, how do you how do you uh, if you, if you have an issue how do you how do you, how do you make that issue known? So all of those things ensure that the investor you know it has confidence in the system. We have regulators that also ensure that you know um, customers are treated fairly. You know uh, we are transparent with our pricing. We are transparent with how we resolve issues. We have ombud ombudsman desk across the industry to ensure that see we continue to generate uh, investor confidence. So those will be my thoughts around the, uh, uh, the question you asked me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shay. Next, I'm going to move to um, Yewande. Um, Yewande, what do you think are the key strategies that the Nigerian government should employ to promote foreign and domestic investment in the country? Are there perhaps low hanging fruits, maybe in the form of potential incentives to encourage foreign investors to choose Nigeria as their investment destination? And then before you proceed, can I just um, ask the participating audience to place any questions they have in the chat box as we as we go along. Thank you. Please go ahead, Yewande. Thank you, Ms. Fireco. Um, first, I, it would have been good if somebody from government was listening so that they actually take this message away. Um, but the first thing I think that government needs in terms of attracting investment is to remember that capital is a coward. 
Um, investors are very brave. Otherwise, they will not venture beyond, you know, the comfort of comfortable places. But capital, you know, is a coward. Capital likes to go where it is courted, where it is made comfortable, and where it does not feel threatened at all. So from the perspective of, you know, attracting investors, the first thing is policy consistency, policy clarity, and policy stability. Investors like to be able to plan, you know, even portfolio investors that government agencies generally think of as fly-by-night investors, you know, they come and go. Um, portfolio investors are an important part of the investment dynamic. You need both portfolio and um, direct, but even portfolio investors, you know, thrive with clarity and consistency. Then Nigeria is obviously a complex um, federation. Policies are generally made by the federal government and its ministries and the like, but investors engage not with the federal, but with the states, because that's where investments sit. And state governors have a fair bit of power. So it is important that the federal and the state are aligned, you know, that government remembers that no investor will come because government says they're ready for business or they're open for business. It is that their experience of interacting with the country actually delivers that promise of they're ready for business or they're open for business. Um, all of this speak to, you know, making the investment environment conducive for business. I think on top of that, government then needs to layer what I will call proactive investment promotion and facilitation. The competition for capital is real. The competition for capital is fierce. And for every investor that could come to Nigeria, there's several other countries you know, that they could go to. There are very few things that you can do only in one country in the world. For most things, you know, investors have options. So it is important that we proactively proactively decide the kind of investors we want, you know, and actively go after them. Um, and where investors come to Nigeria, where investors brave the difficulty of the challenge and come, I think it is important that government gets out of the way of good business. Quite often, government agencies act like they are upset when business thrives in Nigeria. You know, the business that thrives then becomes, you know, that tallest one in the room and therefore the one that everybody targets. Whereas the business that thrives should serve as a litmus, as an advocate of what is possible in the country. Um, and what, we, what I think government should demand from businesses that thrive is that they're good corporate citizens. But government should do everything that it can, you know, to help good business, you know, thrive in the country. I'm going to stop there so that I don't talk the time. So we have enough time to go around the, yes. the panel. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, um, you and You've provided um, perspective both from um, private sector and, and, and public sector. Um, you've provided insights for both the private and the public sector. Um, given that you have experience working in both, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are people on, on, on the webinar who who are from government and who are benefiting from the insights that you, you have provided. Oyinda um, Mola. Oyinda Mola. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, could, could you provide insight into the potential risks and challenges that investors should be aware of when considering an investment in Nigeria and talk about how these can be avoided or mitigated? Okay. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for the invite to the panel. Um, like Nigeria, like every other country, has um, risk you know, involved in investing in the country. So I'll just mention a few and then talk about um, some mitigants that can be put in place. I'm not sure if uh, this risk can be eliminated uh, completely, but I believe there are mitigants that can be put in place. Um, I'll start with the what I will call um, country risk. And uh, there are various uh, aspects uh, to, to this type of risk, uh, one of which is the economic risk. Um, and um, the economic risk involves like macroeconomic factors such as uh, inflation, 
um, and uh, currency devaluation, which is very, which are very present issues in Nigeria at the moment. Uh, we've had a spike in inflation rates, and as of September, it was uh, hedging towards 27%. And despite uh, efforts by uh, the CBN and other um, measures being put in place, it continues to gradually um, increase. Um, such um, factors are things that need to be considered when making investments because they could erode returns and narrow profit margins for companies that are seeking to or have made investments in Nigeria. Um, there, there will be increased um, costs, especially companies that have to import um, their raw materials or products that they or materials they need to uh, carry on the business in Nigeria. And then there would also be um, issues of reduced sales, even if the companies try to pass on, you know, those costs, you know, in terms of price increase, there's reduced um, availability of free cash flow generally, and um, they'll, they'll probably experience a reduction in sales. And you've had certain companies, you know, like Unilever, close up segments of their business, um, even after years of you know, carrying on business in Nigeria because of um, these issues. And then other companies that have experienced uh, foreign exchange losses in their performance this year, especially because of the constant devaluation of the currency and how it affects their foreign um, liabilities on their books. Um, closely linked to that are what you can call political risk. Um, for Nigeria, we've had a little bit of uh, stability politically at least we've had uh, uh, been in democracy for about 24 years now. However, there still remains tensions, especially during election years, um, which this year is one of, of, of those, and um, the uncertainty with the challenge of the election results and outcomes. And um, you know, there's sensitivities around those periods that need to be considered. Then there are other things um, around the government uh, changes to laws and policies, which has already been mentioned. Um, the need for consistency and the fact that there are changes that happen often are things that need to be considered and evaluated in making investments in Nigeria. And then we've had um, incidences, even though I believe they are reduced now, of um, indirect expropriation, such as um, uncertainty with respect to renewal of licenses. Um, I recall that this was uh, a, a concern when we were trying to make our recent acquisitions and the foreign um, financiers were quite concerned because we had licenses that were almost due for renewal as at the time of um, acquisition. Ideally, this should not be, there should be certainty around the fact that a company that requires a license to do business will definitely get those licenses uh, renewed. Uh, so these are things that need to be considered. Um, a present risk um, that I would like to mention is um, around the repatriation uh, transfer of uh, funds. So um, if you have foreign direct investments into a country, it's necessary for those investors to be guaranteed um, a repatriation or transfer back of the profits that they make from such investments. Um, we are aware that um, for the past three years, there are about since uh, COVID um, period started that we've had uh, challenges with uh, foreign exchange, and there's been difficulty with repatriation of the uh, funds uh, by foreign investors. Even though I know that there are promises uh, to make uh, funds available in the next couple of weeks, um, again, just like you and they said, it's in the experience that we we'll know uh, more than in the promises, you know, whether um, this risk is going to be reduced in the near future. Um, another um, risk that uh, I'd like to mention, which has been touched on by other speakers, uh, is respect to inadequate infrastructure. Uh, we are aware that Nigeria suffers from a debt of um, adequate infrastructure, both social and economic infrastructure, and uh, this hinders um, economic development and also makes um, investing in Nigeria more expensive uh, because you find out that you have to sort of put in place your own infrastructure um, your own power and sometimes even um, transport facilities and the likes to be able to carry on uh, business in Nigeria. So this is a, a risk that needs to be considered and it's really depending on the type of business that um, you're looking to invest in. Some businesses have this as a more present issue 
than others. Um, security is a big one, uh, as we well know, even though it could be geographically defined, um, as some geographies have certain security issues and others don't within the country, but um, issues like terrorism um, are very present. Uh, kidnapping issues um, exist, vandalism in the oil and gas sector, um, illegal bunkering and uh, crude thefts um, has been a major issue that has affected um, the Nigerian uh, production generally and um, is a major focus on the oil and gas sector to, to resolve and reduce, um, which has been happening and we've been seeing improvements in that. And then other crimes as well that um, generally exist in Nigeria are also present um, security risks to consider. Corruption, um, we cannot go without mentioning the corruption risks that exist generally in Africa as well as in Nigeria. And um, this is a present risk, especially for companies or investors coming from um, um, jurisdictions where you have stringent and corruption laws. Um, this is usually top on the list for investors, um, as we all know, corruption um, increases bureaucracy, increases uncertainty, um, it could increase, increase the length of time for you to get um, uh, governmental processes um, done or approvals in place. And generally, it creates inefficiencies for your investments, which could erode your returns in the, in the long term. Um, another risk, which um, personally for me as a lawyer uh, is, a, is a personal pain point, is the regulatory risk. Um, the complexity of regulations in Nigeria, the opacity, it's, it's, it, there's just so much. And um, the thing is, with, the, with each new initiative that comes up, with each new policy, the, each, um, there's new agencies set up. The agencies issue new laws, new regulations. You have uh, multi-level and duplicated regulatory agencies you spend a lot of time and a lot of costs, you know, um, on compliance, trying to understand, trying to preempt, trying not to be taken by surprise. Um, one, you wake up one day and you find out that there's this agency that you haven't been, um, had some rules that you were not aware of at the state level, at the government level, spend so much time writing um, responses to demands and claims and, you know, just trying to navigate the regulatory environment. Um, also, there are changes to regulatory leadership and this causes distractions to the regulators sometimes, you know, because they spend so much time. Um, there's periods of time where they are just concerned with, you know, the changes and just trying to navigate their way um, through changes, organizational changes, leadership changes, and um, which slows down things for, um, you know, a business person. And then other regulatory changes that keep happening that um, you have to grapple with new increased costs, you know, increased um, fines, penalties. And just like you they rightly said, almost as if there's um, penalties for uh, doing uh, well or doing good in business. Uh, lastly, I'd like to mention the cultural risk. Uh, we've highlighted the fact that Nigeria, uh, Africa, the Population um, is one of the um, strengths of the country, but also we have a very diverse uh, culture um, in Nigeria. There's over 250 ethnic groups, and uh, that means that you have to carefully study consumer behavior, consumer pre uh, preferences, uh, the peculiarities attached to Nigerians, um, respect to incentives, even um, respect to employees in Nigeria, the peculiarities of their preferences. Um, you also need to be studied. So going from the risk to the mitigants and just quickly Thank you, Indamola. <laughs> Thank you, Indamola. <laughs> yeah. We have if to I move to the speak... next question. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank All you, Indamola. Right. We have to move to the next question now. And the next question is um, for, for she. Um, in, in view of your, your impressive portfolio as, um, your, as um, ED of African subsidiaries, you know, we, we'd like you to... to provide insight on the potential implications of international trade agreements and partnerships, such as the African Continental Free Trade Agreement on Nigeria's investment exchange environment and the investment climate generally in Nigeria. Right. The floor is yours, Shane. Thank, thank you, Bumi. And I think um, uh, Bolaji made my job very easy. Uh, that was an excellent chat. I'm not sure I could have. Uh, and, and I think the uh, ACFTA is a... Um, 
is a clear demonstration of um, Africa to try and integrate uh, our economies, um, to try and create, uh, remove tariffs, ensure free movement of, um, of of goods, you know, to look like what we have in the uh, European Union. Even we still need to get visas to go to other African countries. In Europe, it doesn't happen like that. You know, so those are some of the things that you see as a, as fallible in data. You have the Asia Pacific Trade Agreement. So these things are, uh, you even have it in South Africa. So these things are, um, what you see that you know try to integrate trade uh, across Africa. Uh, Africa is about 1.3 billion people, just like um, I said earlier, um, GDP of 3.4. So it's, it's, it's a real big block that we can put together. It can help us um, uh, negotiate in, in, in the scheme of things. If you look at Africa, um, I think last year we did around just under $70 billion of trade. Um, we, I think if you look at intra-African trading there, it's about 13%. Um, um, the projection is that by 2025, this is going to get to about 50% in terms of what the ACFT is meant to achieve. Um, what you find is that in Africa, what do we, where, what do we trade? Um, a lot of commodities, cocoa, oil and oil, uh, gas, oil, diamond, you know, uh, and, and, and crude oil. So really we, from a trading perspective, um, we trade with other parts of the world. And therefore this skew has to be that within Africa, we have to start adding value to goods and services so that we can you know, start to trade within, 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 within ourselves. Um, from a Nigerian perspective, we joined AFCAT in uh, ACFT in, in 2019. Um, I think if you look at what has happened between 21 and 20, 2022, what we see is that actually our inter African trade has dropped from about 7.4 to 6.5 in 2020. So we are not seeing that benefit. And why, and why are we not seeing that benefit? Uh, a couple of things. Um, there is still infrastructure to support that process, all right? And that infrastructure hasn't, 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 hasn't been built. Uh, payment, for instance, is one. Uh, if I am in, um, if I am in um, Gaborone, all right, and I want to pay somebody in Lusaka, um, in Zambia, how am I going to do it today? There is no, and that's why uh, between Afrexim and after they, they've created something called PAPS, now that is at its early stage. Perhaps it's meant to allow those type of things happen, to allow you know payment. That is Pan African payment system to allow type of payment. So the infrastructure. So there has to be payment for trade to happen. There has to be payment. So if the payment infrastructure does not happen, then to to get trade to move quickly will be very limited. And that's one of the that's one of the challenges. But this is this is is um there is work in progress. Uh, if you look at what has happened to Perhaps today, uh, it, most of the West African countries are now in it. Nigeria has gone live just to the CBN is supported that process by bringing out uh, a circular that will support how that will be done. So we're making progress. I'm just saying it's a bit too slow for where we need to be and in terms of the size, the size of um, uh, trade that we have. One of the things that, you know, this on the, on the FX environment is for Africa generally is um, if you look at the African currencies, uh, if it's a Kwanzaa you take in Angola, or is it Mete Cash in Mozambique, or is it Ghana cities, or is it Kenyan shillings? Um, yesterday, Kenyan shillings dropped to about 150, the lowest ever. Um, so what is happening is that because of these, all of these things, if you could trade within ourselves, all right, we would not need that much of an exchange to the dollar. Because, but because today, if I want to do something in Kenya, I have to first of all, maybe move to uh, move to dollar, go to uh, Kenyan shillings and back. So all of those things, if this was working, all right, what it would do is that it will reduce the amount of transmission that needs to go up and we can redeem ourselves and reduce the demand and also depreciation in our currency. Um, it's going to promote stability of our currencies. It's going to lower demand for, for, for USD. It's also going to promote investment. But what you find is that if somebody, all right, that is in Accra, all right, knows that he has production, today is doing subsistent production. And as he sees as I there's somebody in Gaborone who wants to buy that product as a payment system. Now, what happens is that it can then start to increase production. Now, to increase production, you need investment. And what is meant to happen is that with AFCA, production is meant to increase and investment is meant to increase. And so this is one of the, one of the benefits of, of, of what you see. So really, um, it also provide liquidity. Liquidity today that we are looking for um, to, to buy US. We won't need that liquidity anymore. That liquidity will stay, will stay within Africa. So the objective is over the next five years, uh, we, we want to see this trade at around 53%, it's still at 17. 
Um, but I think that with the work that is being done by the Secretariat, uh, there are a number of things that still need to be done. But I think just like uh, Bola just said, uh, is a gold mine. We have the population, we have the arable land. It just for us together, act together. Uh, and it's for, for things, I was mentioning things like visa, for instance, okay, how are we going to compete with the EU? Because when you're in the EU, you don't need visa to enter any of the country. But when you're in Africa, maybe you wait for two weeks to get a visa into Angola, into Mozambique. How are you going to ensure that, see, free movement of goods and services and people? Those are the things that enable integration happen. And today in, in Africa, it's not there. And I think those are the next step where we're going to do. So thank you, um, Agumi. Thank you, Shane. Um, moving swiftly along, we'll, um, Yewande, next question is for you. Um, in, in what ways do you believe collaboration amongst government agencies, private sector entities, and international agencies can create a more favorable investment ecosystem in Nigeria? The public sector and the private sector speak different languages. Um, and what drives them? You know, is different for a lot of the international agencies. Again, they're also diff driven by different um, objectives. I think working together is the, you know, ideal way um, for government and the private sector to jointly achieve uh, uh, the objective of a favorable um, investment um, ecosystem. Um, but because government plays such a, you know, material role, I mean, I would say that a government agency like NIPC, which has primarily responsibility for investment promotion, should be at the forefront, you know, of driving that charge. But NIPC at the forefront of that charge cannot do it without the rest of government essentially aligning itself. And there's often a mentality that because there's a government agency that is responsible for investment promotion, you can leave everything to that agency. And everybody else almost operates, you know, the way they deem fit, the way they interpret it. So there needs to be some um, coherence about the way you know, government policies and government agencies operate to almost considering um, the investor as the ultimate boss. For international agencies, you know, because, you know, whether we are like to admit it or not, there's a material lack of capacity in government agencies. Most government agencies in reality don't have the capacity institutionally to deliver on the mandates that they were charged with. So you invariably have them appointing consultants and the like to do you know, this, that, and the other. The private sector can help with ensuring that institutional capacity is built in the agency. That's a long-term plan. It's not something you do to, you know, for a conference, for a seminar, you know, for to get one investment across the line. But it's something that will take a while, but deepens the bench strength and the ability of the government agency to deliver on its objectives. We have tried when I was in NIPC, I regret to say without success, to create an investment promotion club, you know, that was aimed at having the public and private sector hunt together. Um, you know, public sector responsible for policies, but doesn't sufficiently speak the business, the language of um business. And not fully aware of the commercial value of the information they have access to and the relationships you know, they sit on. Um, so the objective of that investment promotion club was to cross-pollinate public and private sector. So investment promotion engagements and events and the like are coordinated between government and private sector. Perhaps it's something you know, that your firm you know, can consider um, pushing for from the private sector. Essentially, you know, what I was trying to do when I was in government was to push it out. You know, perhaps the private sector can pull it out of government. Um, but I think a platform like that for hunting together, targeted um, deliberately at investors with the private sector's commercial objective of, you know, this will deliver the goods and the public sector's ability to not just say but deliver if the government is fully behind its word of being open for business. I'm going to stop there so that you have time uh, to, uh, thank to you, go around. You and, Dee, and thank you for that steer in terms of the um, investment promotion club. Um, what would you say were 
the um, obstacles to the success of, of that initiative? Honestly, the my colleagues in the agency just did not get it. <laughs> okay. So there wasn't enough institutional capacity in the agency to do it. You know, the Czech Republic had done something similar um, maybe 10 odd years ago, you know, to great success. So I, they were more interested in going to see what the Czech Republic had done than, you know, curating what we were trying to do. And I'm happy to share, you know, with you after this um, workshop, you know, some of the materials that were put together. Thank you, Yorante. So, sorry to cut you off earlier, but you know, no problem. I understand. <laughs> so, 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 so moving along, can, can you please highlight the key areas in the Nigerian energy sector where significant investment opportunities are, are emerging and what unique investment promotion and facilitation measures do you think should be put in place to encourage growth in these areas? Thank you. Okay, um, the energy sector has, um, as we're all aware, there's the power sector, and even though power may not seem to be emerging, um, um, actually emerging, but there's a different slant to it with the passing of the Electricity Act that repealed the Electric Power Sector Reform Act, and um, which opened up power generation to generation transmission and uh, distribution to states, uh, companies and uh, individuals. So there's now uh, more opportunity to play um, at the state level and generate power um, at that level. However, it's still developing because the states have to put in their legal framework um, to regulate and guide around how this will be uh, carried out. So this is a space that I believe that uh, can be looked into and can be expanded into. Um, also of interest, um, as we know, is renewable energy. Uh, there's been a lot um, since the early, uh, a couple of years back now, the government has released several policies and action plans uh, for development of investment in renewable energy. And um, the Electricity Act actually speaks to uh, set up provisions um, around investment in renewable energy and also provides for the creation of specific investments by the Ministry of Finance um, for, I mean, incentives for investments in renewable energy. So this is also something to look out for and wait for details of those incentives, even though there are existing incentives that could be taken advantage of, like uh, the pioneer status and um, some VAT uh, exemptions that were given to importation of equipment. Uh, that would also support investments in that area. Um, the investment in renewable energy cuts across the various types, even though solar uh, power is the most um, uh, common type of investment now, but there's also hydropower, there's uh, wind and uh, biomass, and there are different investments that are already being made at state level, national level, um, by NMPC you know, with respect to uh, renewable energies or those types of renewable energies. Uh, moving from renewable energy uh, and power generation or power supply, um, I'll move to oil and gas and the passing of the PIA to two years ago. And uh, the aim of the PIA was after, after more than 20 years, about 20 years of um, trying to get an act uh, passed for the petroleum industry, the aim is to open up the oil and gas sector and uh, create massive investment opportunities. One thing that the PIA has done is to create very separate um, upstream, midstream, and downstream uh, segments of the oil and gas industry uh, with clear, the distinct regulators for those uh, uh, segments and also a, a licensing regime, especially for the midstream, which never really existed as a standalone segment uh, prior to the PIA. Uh, so this creates investment opportunities for uh, businesses to invest in um, um, the midstream sector and uh, the downstream, offstream remains at sea. Uh, there's still significant uh, oil and gas reserves that we have in Nigeria, and um, it's open to to investment. Um, the the midstream uh, sector has uh, like gas processing. I'll speak to gas now. Um, gas processing, gas transportation. These are areas that um, could use. Um, could do with new investments, um, additional investments, and people could consider investing in. 
uh, there's opportunities for gas exploration as well. Um, um, and also um, processing of gas like CNG, for instance, uh, given the recent uh, removal of false subsidy, uh, there's a focus on CNG. The president has signed in the C signed a approved the CNG initiative, and um, there's um, many people looking into investing in um, conversion kits for conversion of uh, petrol powered cars and uh, equipment, and also um, just um, providing more CNG filling stations and um, availability of CNG generally um, for mass. Uh, public transports and for uh, small and medium-sized businesses. Um, there's also opportunity to um, increase uh, the liquefied natural gas um, investments in Nigeria. And um, I guess the NPC has taken the lead with um, signing um, or getting to FID, final investment decision on a floating liquefied natural gas uh, facility um, in recent uh, times. Um, there are other products from you know, um, gas um, gas can be used as feedstock for petrochemical and fertilizers. Uh, this could use um, could do with increased investment as well. Another area that um, is developing is the flare gas, even though it's not on a large scale, but um, that's an opportunity that is there, and we are having several discussions with respect to that um, as well. Uh, there's a Nigerian Nigerian gas flare uh, commercialization program that is in place. Uh, the Recent um, awardees of, to the license have been announced. And then there's also the bilateral um, arrangements that will be entered into for flare sites that are not part of that program. And uh, most of those projects involve the um, using the gas, processing the gas um, on a modular scale, uh, mostly uh, to sell power to neighboring um, communities. So it doesn't require much. Uh, extensive transportation to sell power to sell cng to sell lpg um, and make power available and gas available to local communities around the area where the uh, processing takes place there's also carbon capture um, and storage and carbon emission trading uh, nigeria passed the climate change act in 2021 and uh, set up the national uh, national council on climate change in 2022 there's um we're still waiting for more to come from the council, but um, they've started some activity. I, I know that there's a carbon trading that uh, goes on in Nigeria right now, but it's not really regulated. Uh, it's based on people deciding how to measure reports and verify whatever carbon emission records that they come up with and, and um, sell. So the council will do well to you know, put in place um, more structured frameworks for that. And then, like I mentioned, the carbon capture and um, um, uh, carbon capture and storage is also an area, especially because Nigeria is still involved in developing fossil fuel. Um, that would help us to is the market for capturing carbon and reduce emissions and the negative effects of um, fossil fuel activities. And so, those are a few areas that could be considered on small, medium, and large scale. And then there are also support services, which we shouldn't forget, that are connected to all of these. So, support services equipment manufacturers, um, engineers, and consultants, and the like. So these are also business areas to consider for Thank the you. energy Thank sector. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Aida Mola. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we've all been greatly enriched by the insights that have been shared by Shea Yewande and Aida Mola. And we have three questions in the chat box. Um, I'll, I'll read, I don't know if the uh, panelists have access to the questions or whether, um, if I can't even see the panelists. Okay, I'll read them out and then I, I will assign them accordingly. So the first one is, um, do, Nigerians, do, do Nigeria's numerous special economic zones or free trade areas provide regulation relief and foreign currency facilitation to foreign direct investors? Um, I'll direct that question to she. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. So, so, Did you hear so, the question? So, yes. Uh, okay. Let me let me let me try and see if I do. Nigeria number special free provide regulation relief and foreign currency facilitation to direct 
Um, no, 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 I'll say no. And the reason I say no is that the, the way the, um, so like I said, I was explaining PAPS earlier. Uh, and that what is happening with PAPS is that the central banks are having to support with liquidity and support with foreign currency to be able to, for those payments to happen. Now, what is also happening is that even within that, because there are many countries in Africa, all right, where the central banks today, and that's part of the problem, where the, that's part of the issues that the central banks, the political will, all right, to make this happen is not. So what you find that your banks are now stepping into that role of providing settlement for in, in areas where the central banks are not. So that, that, that's for, for, that, at least from a settlement perspective. I think uh, you might want to add um, something. Yeah, thanks, Jay. I don't remember the details um, properly, um, but there are different types of special economic zones, and some of them do provide regulation relief. An export processing zone, for instance, right. Right. provides right. relief from many of the their design, even by their design, to right. save investors from a lot of the grief that they face in dealing onshore. You know, the objective of the special economic zone is almost to create an oasis of sanity, right. you know, away from some of the challenges that investors face. But the foreign currency facilitation bit is not one of the things that special economic zones provide. A lot of them are designed for export and because they will be foreign currency generating. The expectation is that in the investors who operate in them source their foreign currency outside of the banking system. So accessing, you know, competing with, especially they're, because they're material benefits that they get, competing with those who operate onshore Nigeria, where the special economic zones are regarded as offshore Nigeria, if you like, competing with them for, and foreign currency is not something that the central bank would generally allow because they are designed, you know, specifically for for export. Just to add to, so if you look in, in Ghana as well, so those economic zones, so um, you have to export seventy percent of your of your product. Only thirty percent are allowed to. So that's what we find in terms of how they are designed. Um, I was just speaking really about the after, as opposed to but the economic zone. Yes, the idea is that. Uh, we want to promote export. We'll give you special, we'll give you tax holidays, we'll give you incentives to produce. However, you have to export. So so, so that's the way to, it is designed. But I don't think on the FX side, uh, that is what you what that has been created as, as, as an incentive. Thank you, Shi and Yiwande. That, that question was from Masood Janike. Um, another question we have is, you know, um, what do you tell a foreign prospective investor who wants to invest in the aviation and tourism sectors of the economy? Yewande, do you want to take that? Um, I will struggle with the specific sectors, um, you know, because investing in such heavily regulated, especially aviation, you know, sectors is driven by what the particular policies um, and the nuances of the industry are. I'm not an expert in those specific industries, and this question seems specific to those industries. So, I'll, so I'll struggle um, with answering that. But I'm very happy to take the the um, other question, which asks why we are. Um, should I go ahead, Ms. Yes, Parker, please you go want ahead. To yes, that, that 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 okay. question that question that. Um you know, the, in relation to aviation and tourism was from Tonya Kukubo. And the third question, which you're about to answer is from Chioma Uwobi. Please go ahead, Jemante. So Chioma is asking why we're, you know, promoting or, you know, focused on foreign investments when we have not finished dealing essentially with the challenges of domestic investors. And the first thing I'll say to Chioma is that you're right. Um, you know, we need domestic investors as we need foreign investors. But Nigeria and every country in the world, you know, should not, should make no bones about the importance of having, you know, foreign investments. Even the biggest capital exporting countries in the world, the US, you know, the UK, China and the like, are also active um, sources of foreign in investment because they realize that it makes a material um, invest, it, it makes a material impact on their economic prospects. So the focus that you see 
on foreign investment is not meant to give the impression that it is in isolation of an interest in domestic investments. You know, we actually need both. Maybe it's a case of taking the person who is close to you a little bit for granted, you know, and chasing the one who's further away. But there's definitely, you know, an interest in sourcing both. And if I can speak from a government perspective, when I was at NIPC, you know, we had a strategy for domestic direct investment as we had a strategy for foreign direct investment. Um, because domestic investors don't have the same kind of country risk bias, you know, that foreign investors carry because they breathe country risk, they eat country risk, it's already in their skin. Um, but but the impression, if if that's what you're taking away, is not that the country wants only foreign investment. We actually, you know, need both. You're muted. Thank you very much, Yoande. We have one additional question. How robust is the Nigerian judicial system in speedy and relatively inexpensive conflict resolution matters? But we've come to, you know, uh, we, we no longer have um, time. The, we've come to the end of our time slot for, the, for, for, for this panel. So what we would do is we will send a response to, to the chat. That, that, that question is from Carrie in Guinea. We will send you your response. If, you would like to drop your, your email in the chat. We'll, we'll get back to you with a response. Thank, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our panelists for the incredible insights and information that you've shared with us today. I'm sure all the um, participants who have listened in have, have gained a lot from, from, from this panel. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving up time from your very, very busy schedules to be with us today. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chay, Thank good you. to see you. Take care. Have a good day. Okay. Um, thank you very much to uh, the speakers in the first session. We'll move on very quickly to the uh, second session, which is on exploring infrastructure and the public private partnership landscape in Nigeria. I uh, would agree that infrastructure development is a critical factor in driving economic growth. Uh, however, it requires huge funding, and the huge capital deficit within that sector has necessitated public private partnerships, which has attracted investors within this space. Now, the panel in the second session will discuss experiences within and how to tread the Nigerian infrastructure PVP landscape. Um, this session will be moderated by Mrs. Ohoho Makinde, who is a partner and the head of the business advisory team at Alukwana Ibodi. Um, on the session will be Mr. Suren Abiwikrema and Mr. Taiwo Adiniji. Mr. Abiwikrema has over 27 years experience in manufacturing, production, sales, and marketing, 20 of which you know, he's garnered in his position as CEO and at director levels um, for multinational companies within the Australasian, Pacific regions, and Sri Lanka. Um, he's skilled in determining business strategy and has established a strong track record for driving market expansion, new product launches, and business development in highly competitive and regulated markets. He's currently the Chief Executive Officer Arise Integrated Industrial Platforms and also the Honorary Consul to the Government of the Republic of Vanuatu. Mr. Tai Wadiniji uh, is currently the Senior Director, Investment Operations and Execution at the Africa Finance Corporation with responsibility, among other for the institution's investment in oil and gas and mining projects. He has over 26 years of postgraduate, postgraduate experience um, in several areas of banking and finance. He has deep knowledge and extensive experience with infrastructure and mining policy issues, as well as the analysis, evaluation, and financing of infrastructure and mining projects. He has supervised EFC's investment in mining projects, as well as in different geographies, including countries in West, North, and Central Africa. He has also worked with the African Development Bank, focusing largely on infrastructure investments and financial sector development. Uh, very quickly, I will hand over to Mrs. Makende to take on the second session. Thank you. Thank you, Oladuke. I think we had really great discussions during the first um, panel with um, really well um, versed um, pa panelists. I think um, Mrs. Um, Kofu Dosako and um, Bolaji Balogun, who I call Bibi the Great give us a good um, insight into the growth prospects for Nigeria in the next um, 
20 to 50 years, depending on the data that you're looking at. But let's go straight to the order of the day. Um, we're going to be looking at this from a, a foreign investor as well as a, a, a financing and, and structuring perspective. So, Sharon, I'll start with you. The first panel dealt with all of the challenges, uh, both in government and also uh, economy and uh, infrastructure-wise. My question, Sharon, would be that, um, as a foreign investor, what do you think are the key benefits of infrastructure development, both for the government and, and for Nigeria? You have a, a good insight um, Africa-wide, and, and I'd like to hear your views. Thank you. First of all, uh, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, first of all, good morning and good afternoon to some of you. And also, I would like to thank uh, Alan and Oluko Ebade for having me on the roadshow. And uh, dignitaries, distinguished guests, I stand on protocol. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, we, there we have our group Arise Integrated Platforms, uh, quite a bit of experience in Nigeria as well here. See, the value addition of uh, PPP are uh, and have always been a significant because the the structure, you know, harnesses the strength of both parties. So I believe this is one of the reasons why this model is becoming increasingly encouraged. Uh, one of our focus areas at Arise is infrastructure development, particularly free trade zone, special economic zones, ports, and logistics, also roads, highways, and more. So we have our presence in about 10 countries in Africa where we operate the same PPP model, slightly adjusted to the tunes of the governments and the countries' requirements. So we do have a good basis of assessment, which is being done in all these countries and being implemented. The key benefit of PPPs is infrastructure development that we have been able to identify which all touch on the government, see, and the people. Of course, economic growth, job creation, uh, involved in long-term investments and building international relations. So these have been the key. Now, in terms for a private sector, the PPP model actually lowers some barriers to entry because there is a aligned interest with the government and this in turn, facilitates our attraction and ease of doing business. So this is where the synergy comes in. And we have seen this across Africa in all 10 countries we operate and also in Nigeria, a good state which our project is. In terms of how Nigeria can make its investor climate more conducive, I think uh, there is already a good foundation, uh, especially from the good state government to look at example because Arise is already here in Nigeria with a good sale. So their PPP portfolio is quite comprehensive. You know, it, it, it includes projects under transport, power, infrastructure, communication, technology, as well as agriculture and non-agro-allied industries, health, renewable energy, environment, and cultural and tourism. So all these open up numerous investment opportunities to develop a cohesive ecosystem uh, in the state and in the country. That said, as always, there's room for more progress and improve attractiveness in the area of economic stability, as well as uh, business-friendly environment and policies matching the global economic outlook. So we see there are gaps which needs to be enhanced, which we are talking to the government and trying to improve on a regular basis. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that, Shireen. And so, Tyro, on to you. We've seen, we have heard a bit from the foreign investor side. I would like to ask you a question as someone who's worked in the PPP space and structuring as well as um, advising on these um, deals. What, in your opinion, really are the key benefits of PPP for infrastructure development? And how do you think the, the government and the private sector can be uh, can work in synergy in developing Nigeria's infrastructure 
um, um, addressing Nigeria's infrastructure deficit. Thank you, Ogogo, and uh, I thank um, uh, fellow panelists as well as uh, our audience. Good day, everyone. Um, uh, PPP, uh, I will say, is practically uh, inevitable in terms of uh, enhancing the infrastructure development, not only of Nigeria, but uh, Africa generally. And that's uh, likely because the, the infrastructure deficit is massive and uh, the resources of the government to meet the deficits uh, is very limited, uh, as we have seen all along. So um, if, you, if you are looking at the infrastructure deficit, I mean, there are different uh, estimates of how much funding uh, will be required to uh, clear the deficit and upgrade our infrastructure. But this may range from between 100 billion US dollars to 200 billion US dollars every year for the next 30 years to try and clear the infrastructure deficit in Nigeria. And frankly, um, we don't really need to uh, believe the uh, the estimates or not, because we see it all around ourselves. You know, our roads are not where they're supposed to be. Uh, the, the railway system is practically non-existent. Our uh, airports uh, have seen better times. The seaports is a big uh, disincentive to investment, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we have all of these uh, challenges that uh, needs to be uh, addressed and, and the resources are limited. So um, what that means is that the government needs to find a, another source, uh, need to en uh, enhance the sources available to meet all of this, uh, all of these challenges, and that's why PPP comes in. Uh, the PPP provides the platform for collaboration between the government, the public sector, and the private sector to deal with uh, infrastructure deficit. For the government, what the government getting out of um, a PPP arrangement one um, is able to leverage on the resources of the private sector to provide services, which the populace generally believe is the responsibility of the government to provide. Uh, the, the populace believes that you know, uh, having a good road is the responsibility of the government. Uh, having electricity uh, is, is the responsibility of the government. The Air Force working well is the responsibility of the government. So the, so the government needs to find partners that can help build deliver its uh, its responsibilities, and for the private sector, the um it is is an opportunity to invest in an asset class that can provide you stable long term return, because for the private sector, um you know the the, the name of the game uh, is uh, good investments and good returns. So if you have uh, you have an opportunity to invest in a good asset that can give you long-term stable return, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a win-win situation. And uh, what the government needs to do to, uh, to make it easy, uh, make it um, for private sector to come in, the, 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 the most important thing is clarity. Uh, for the private uh, investor, you, they need to be clear what they are getting into. You know, the, the environment has to be right and the rules has to be clear. Uh, the private sector can uh, deal with risks. Uh, when they are going to this investment, they know they are taking a risky uh, position. But um, for the private investor, uh, risk management is is uh, is the name of the game. Is, is is their job. So they can deal with risk. What they cannot deal with is uncertainty. When things change from day to day, from one government to the next, from one period to the next, that's so. If we have a well-defined rule uh, of uh, for PPPs that will uh, allow uh, an investor coming in to know exactly 
what he's getting into, what he can expect, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that will, that will greatly help. And I must say that uh, in Nigeria, uh, there has been lots of uh, efforts made to make the rule clear. You know, you, you have uh, PPP legislation that have been passed, both at the national level and also at uh, several states, including Lagos State, Ogo State, et cetera, that has part PPP regulations. We have the uh, infrastructure uh, regulatory authority, et cetera. So the work is the work is going on. We are seeing some results, but a lot more still needs to be done. Thank you very much, Tyro. So Sharon, I'll come back to you. I mean, the, the challenges are well known and the first panelists um, dealt with that really, um, really deeply. Uh, the, the challenges and, and, and the barriers really to implementing um, PPPs, I would like you to, to tell us as, as an investor currently in Nigeria and um, having long-term plans for Nigeria, what, what, what are the material ones that you have encountered and um, and um, um, how, how do you think that um, investors like um, your, your group, the Arise Group, can navigate uh, uh, these? Thank you, Ogobo. Yes, this is a very interesting question. And like you said, the earlier panel discussion, uh, more detailed uh, holistic areas of this question was discussed. But uh, let me take the opportunities to dive into uh, our experience and what we do Add, that, add more value to a couple of answers which I already got. You know, from my experience, shell perspective, uh, you know, I've been operating in over 10 origin countries, uh, due diligence. Uh, a thorough preliminary feasibility study in collaboration with the resident expert, non resident, you know, uh, non negotiable to understand the full scope components, requirements of the project become such. Because data is of paramount importance uh, when we go into these projects. So uh, having that complete detailed due diligence, uh, detailed business case studies done uh, is of very importance uh, before we embark on a project. Uh, also, uh, this detailed business should be, study should be developed uh, to accommodate contingencies. Uh, and those contingencies can be unique to each country, as well as in particular in Nigeria, it can be unique to each state. So that is uh, in addition to the business case studies which we do which take to consider in Nigeria in particular. Uh, in addition to that, it is also important to maximize the resource and reduce the risk exposure by diversifying the assets. Now, this is very important. Now, for instance, uh, a rice group, uh, we have several integrated uh, PPP projects ongoing in Ogun State. If I take Ogun State as an example, this is where we are doing our first projects. These industrial platform REMO area, which we call the economic cluster or the electropolis economic cluster, which comprises of uh, 5,200 hectares of free trade zone land opportunity in Ubun State, uh, is one example. To be take the zone, we will have uh, agro industrial zone, special agro processing zone, we will have uh, uh, non agro special zone, we'll have uh, international cargo and passenger airport built inside it, we'll have a greenhouse zone. So, likewise, the, even the FTZ is broken down into sectors uh, uh, and operators. Uh, so, in addition to that, in the state, we are also looking at developing 12,500 hectare deep sea port and free trade zone uh, in Olokola. So, there we again decentralize into, uh, into heavy industries like steel manufacturing, aluminium manufacturing, both into heavy industries there. Then, another important area is in uh, close to OTA, we are developing a 650 hectare union container. Now, all, we all know uh, the dynamics in the port industries, uh, current up our final income, what they are facing uh, today uh, in terms of transition uh, in, in, you know, in the road transition in getting their cargo in, uh, 
uh, 17, 18 days, and you know, takes about three times longer than any other international port to get things clear. So this internal container depot we are developing is a railway depot. So the, we have a railway line going into the Apaka port and it goes through Gun State to Ibadan. So so bypass is the regular road channel. So so if you look at it diversified quite a bit in terms of risk and, and going into a large ecosystem development. So these are the other projects and internationally designed to uh, generate thriving industry ecosystem, which improves our rate of speed for profitability and uh, productivity. Finally, due to the captive uh, incentive nature of the infrastructure projects, further risk exposure can be reduced by uh, exploiting uh, or exploring available finance. I think we spoke about a lot of finance in, in the earlier forums. Uh, this is very important, uh, NIDA funding. So I would call it Africa funding for us across Africa. And particularly in Nigeria is very important. Uh, when we do a project, we look at uh, maybe 75, uh, 25 or 30, 70 e e uh, equity uh, debt ratio on most of our projects. And if you look at projects in West Africa where C5 is if we may go for more uh, USD funding, but in a country like Nigeria, it's very important to focus on uh, syndicating and uh, getting a local. So these are the important things to note. And these are my inputs on this question. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I think an important one that you didn't um, mention directly, I think you alluded to is when you said due diligence is to get good lawyers for mitigating the risk. So Taiwa, come back to you. I, I, you, you will agree with us, Taiwa, that it's time to get creative with regards to how these um, PPP projects can be can be funded. And and I would like you to please give us your views on um, financing options that can be used in Nigeria and and maybe any advice for for governments at, at state and federal levels as they try to to attract um pri private investors into PPP. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Guru. Now, uh, yeah, it's true that um, we need to have, um, you know, we need to be creative in how we finance PPP uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, the the financing requirements are just massive and it's very unlikely that you will have one source to, uh, to, to get all the financing that you, that you require for PPP projects. And part of um, trying to figure out what would be the most uh, appropriate or the most optimal uh, financing for PPPs might also be to look at the value chain or the chain of a typical PPP project. Because a typical infrastructure project, as we know, these are long-term assets. A, a typical infrastructure project can be uh, 30, 40, even 50 years. Uh, mm -hmm. asset class and it may not necessarily be necessary to have uh, one financier financing the project from year one and still be in the same project for the next 40 50 years so we can we can look at the uh, at the at the value chain of a ppp project and see whether we can target financiers that will be more appropriate for specific uh, sections of that of, of that value chain. If you, if you look, a typical uh, PPP project will have the development phase where you are developing the project, um, you know, basically uh, using a lot of lawyers and a lot of uh, engineers, uh, et cetera, to develop the project for you. And uh, for a major PPP project, you know, you are building a major road, you are building a major airport or it's a seaport or something. This phase alone can last anything from three to five years uh, if the project is going to be uh, well developed. And you could have spent 20, 30, 40 million dollars uh, on this phase of the project without seeing anything except a bunch of uh, reports and agreements, etc., etc. 
And, and this is usually the most difficult aspect of financing uh, a PPP project because it's also the most risky because you can do all of this work and at the end of the day, the project is not viable. You cannot get uh, the agreement you have, you need with the government, with the state, et cetera, et cetera. So you might, you might want to have people that are best suited to finance this phase of the project, finance that phase, and then move on to the next phase, which is the construction phase, where I would say the conventional, uh, the conventional financiers, say the bank, the investment banks, the special infrastructure funds, et cetera, can be. So the first phase, the development phase, you know, you can have, uh, you know, private equity uh, funds, you can have uh, special uh, agencies, even special agencies of the government to fund the development just because of the riskiness of that phase of the, of the uh, infrastructure development. And when that phase has been successfully accomplished, the project has been well developed, et cetera, then that project can be sold to people that will not finance it into construction. Um, they, and usually you have most of the, uh, the conventional financiers that can handle construction risk and can, and can finance. And then, you know, construction can be another four or five years and then you, you get to the operating phase. And even when you get to the operating phase, you can have a different set of financiers that will be uh, more interested in financing a project that is already in operation. So an infrastructure project is already in operation. So you know what the cash flow is because uh, usually infrastructure projects has uh, stable cash flow. You know what the mm -hmm. cash flow is, you know what the risk are. You can bring in uh, institutions that, are, that have very low risk tolerance, but can also accept low returns because they, they want low risk. I mean, and I'm talking, for example, pension funds and, um, you know, uh, and, and institutions like that. So, you, so we, we, if you expect that uh, financing and infrastructure, somebody has to start it and take it all the way to the next 40, 50 years, it's going to be challenging. You you probably you read you really find an institution that have that expanse, both in terms of the type of development as well as the length of time. But if you are able to um to divide, uh, basically uh, and all along is also about risk allocation, ensuring that we provide we give the risk at a particular phase of an infrastructure project to the parties that are best suited to, to take those risks. Um, at the development stage, maybe the government, it may be private equity firms that have high risk tolerance, but also want very high return. Um, at the construction phase, maybe more conventional uh, banks and financial institutions that have the expertise to manage construction risk, et cetera. And at the operating phase, it may be those institutions like pension funds that have uh, very low tolerance for risk, but can also uh, accept low returns as long as it's uh, relatively safe and it's long term. So those are some of the things that uh, we should be looking at. And um, we have done uh, AFC, we have done uh, work for um, for the government, for the Federal Ministry of Finance, for the Central Bank of Nigeria, where we have advocated uh, this, uh, this, construct, this uh, financing uh, plan for infrastructure uh, assets, such that we, 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 break things, we break things off, we give each section of the, of the, of the, of the chain to those that, are, that their business model is most um most uh, adapted to that uh, section of the to that section of the chain so those are some of the things that uh, we need to be looking at uh and you know apart from obviously what i had spoken about before ensuring that the uh, economic and the macroeconomic environment is right ensuring that we have uh, predictability we have uh, we have um you know uh, things are clear 
the rules of the game are very clear, etc. And we will be able to get uh, uh, private investors into PPP transactions. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that, Tyro. Really, really insightful. I mean, it's good to know that we don't just have to rely on the clean vanilla financing options all the all the time. Thank you. So, Sharon, I'll come back to you on something that is a really um, hot topic right now, which is um, sustainability and um, and um, social impact and environment. I mean, the, the, the Nigerian government is really keen to ensure, even with all of the macroeconomic issues that we have, to ensure that... Um, projects and 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 have a sustainability and social social impact so how, how do you uh, in the arise group um, incorporate some of these uh, uh, principles into into your investments around the continent thank you for the question it is an important question you have asked uh, because uh, at the rise uh, sustainability is at the heart of everything what we do so that's, say, at Arise, we are a climate company because sustainability is a fundamental part of our strategy. So, say, our sustainability approach consists of uh, four pillars, uh, lying, of course, to the UN uh, 10 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these four are, one is the carbon neutrality, then secondly, uh, diversity and inclusion. Thirdly, circular economy. And uh, fourth, responsible supply chain management. So these are the four key areas. So uh, just to mention a few things. In our first and oldest project, the Gabon Special Economic Zone, we call it GSEZ, uh, which is focused on the timber value chain. We made sustainability, traceability, uh, and certification part of our top priorities. All of Gabon forest concessions are operated according to the Sustainable Forest Management Practice Act, uh, practiced by the Gabonese Forest Code, which ensure that natural regeneration of forest, so sustainable forest management, in the long term, and the sustainable supply of raw materials in terms of traceability. Uh, the Forest Stewards Council FSC was, uh, you know, established, and we follow that code. And and the products being harvested from the FSC forest, uh, when we export, we get a premium on those forests, so that entire sustainability is taken on a very seamless note. Since October 2018, GSEZ has benefited from the services of the Tracer and Cop Agency, which ensures that all logs entering special economic zones are traceable. So this has been our main key focus. If you look at today, we are proud to say that our SEZ in Encore, Gabon, uh, was ranked by FDI Intelligence as the best industrial zone of the world in the wood sector in 2020 and 22 with an honorable mention for the environment practices. So it is also the first carbon neutral certified industrial zone in Africa. Furthermore, in Gabon, we generated over 16,000 direct jobs and 95% of being, of being locals. And also if you look at the gender balance equality, we have 60% being females. I've taken Gabon as an example, actually they have elaborate. We follow this uh, protocol, whether it goes to Benin, Togo, whether it's the cashew value chain, whether it's the cotton value chain. We follow the process. Uh, but I thought Gabon would be a good example as the upper zone. Uh, this is the same approach uh, and strategy we have across all the sectors, like I explained. And that same practice will be incorporated into Nigeria as we start with the Boon State and move forward. For the strategic benefits of sustainability, social impact and environment for Nigeria projects, if I look at, I can say from our experience in Arise that it, is, it opens more doors and unlocks more value. So sustainability is a key element of our strategy for all our projects in Nigeria. It's going to be now, as a part of our pre-construction activities, 
for the industrial platforms remo we call it ipr uh, we have incorporated sustainable elements in our design and and i ensure ensuring all complete full environmental and social compliances by conducting the proper studies now including ifc standard environmental and social impact assessment esi we have already started the process and for ipr by december we are planning to complete the ifc standard esi in addition our goal is to achieve the tangible and sustainable results through knowledge transfer skill acquisition creation creating a uh, uh, creation of a build up uh, for entrepreneurship and a focus on competencies to encourage diversity and inclusion for this uh, we are allocating land to build a vocational training center a vtc and even in the binding agreement we signed with the state government uh, the vtc is incorporated which will be within the zone and which will be a dedicated place for young and eligible members of the local community to be trained so we see this as a paramount importance in not only nigeria we work this cross uh, all the zones in africa and to acquire capabilities needed to get the uh, employed in a ecosystem see in addition to look at we are planning to collect a database to be uh, reviewed for possible recruitment based and eligibility so this creates a pipeline of uh, job creation so furthermore the master plan if you had the industrial platforms remo includes the creation of a public spaces uh, to encourage local entrepreneurship and with regard to com uh, commercial traffic utilities you know facilities such as power telecommunication fire police station they are also available uh, benefits by the way of a proximity to the zone so we look at a work live kind of a concept so we call it work live uh, concept Uh, and a complete ecosystem within a uh, free trade zone when we develop on a separate note we are also collaborating on the own state uh, e mobility i must highlight now with the uh, gas subsidies being taken off and this was touched upon by the earlier panel uh, the gas mobility program is becoming very uh, important and we have aggressively engaged in that so which involves the conversion of mass transit buses from fuel to gas and tricycles and motorcycles to electric so electric motorcycles and buses and tricycles in the gas conversion we have started and we have already converted the pilot project of 17 mass transit buses and we are now working on the next 200 and we have planned to convert 2000 state owned buses and then expand it to interested private sector companies and also expand it to other state and take this uh, project across uh, nigeria uh, mm. so i thought it's important to uh, link that point uh, to your question of sustainability thank interesting you. really interesting thank you so much sir we're running out of time so tayo i'm going to be asking you a really loaded um, question as we round up on our on our panel so uh, you 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 mentioned some of the um, options for funding but i i do have a question for you with regards to advice for potential project sponsors and them um, and their partners and you know we do have a critical funding and um, um, a, a deficit and um, what advice would you give uh, to to make a ppp project more appealing for for investments in 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 the current challenging environment and um what sectors would you see as more pro pro promising for potentially in investors to to look into i know the needs are varied and really wide but what sectors would you think are the like um i don't like the phrase but i'll use it low hanging fruits so okay yeah thanks uh, gogo um well uh, for any infrastructure project the starting point is good project development um, that 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 is the starting point and um usually that is what the government gets wrong uh, when the government is um uh, developing infrastructure projects uh, on their own and that's why you see 
government projects take an uh, unbelievable amount of time. I mean, uh, we all know how long it took Lagos Ibadan Express Road to, to be built or the airport into the city road in Abuja. Each of these take, uh, took 15, sometimes uh, more years to build. And that is because the, the, the project development phase was not done um, the way a private investor uh, would do it. And the way a private investor would do it was not only doing the engineering, but also doing the financing to be sure that uh, you have your full fund funding even before you start the construction of the project. And uh, so for, uh, for the government, as well as for private investors in PPP, first is to ensure that the development phase of the project is giving the, the, the utmost attention the attention that, uh, that that it deserves. If the project is well developed at the development stage, uh, frankly, uh, the chances of uh, of success is much much uh, higher uh, than when uh, the development stage was not uh, as well done. But um, when we are talking about which sectors, um, the the other thing about infrastructure projects is that usually, usually. Uh, infrastructure projects uh, sell their products in the local currency. Uh, you know, if you have a power project, you have a road toll, uh, toll road project, etc. You are collecting uh, your 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 sales proceeds, that is, uh, user fees in local currency. And we all know uh, these days the the big elephant in the room, uh, which is uh, you know currency mm -hmm. depreciation. Uh, uh, etc. And it's not only in Nigeria. Uh, I was, I was um, talking to uh, some people and and showing what in terms of percentages, how much uh, the naira has depreciated. Even in this current, you know, uh, high depreciation uh, uh, period, and comparing it with how other African currencies have depreciated over a similar uh, period of time. And you'll be surprised that some of them have even done much worse than uh, than our Naira here. So it's not only in Nigeria; it's it's a phenomenon that is uh, that is all over. So and uh, for most of the infrastructure projects, you need either you need dollar, you need a lot of foreign inputs. You know, you are building uh, a road, you are building the airport, you are building a power plant. You need to import all your uh, turbines or your engines etc so there is a so um i will say for um the the sectors that have the ability to generate revenues in foreign currency will probably be the uh, ideal sectors for uh, investors uh, and i'm talking i'm looking at sectors such as airports for example when uh, airports are going to be uh, concessioned uh, I will expect to see private investors rushing to to grab those concessions as PPP because they know that they can sell their products for uh, for foreign currency and therefore uh, reduce their any foreign currency exposure that they may have. So I'm looking at uh, airports. I'm looking at seaports, for example. Uh, we have um, seaports that are being uh, developed. Uh, we have privacy ports, we have container ports that are being uh, concessioned as PPP, etc. Those are the areas that I will uh, I will encourage uh, private investors uh, that want to go into PPP to go into those areas where you can mitigate uh, your foreign currency exposure. In some uh, in some other um, in some other. Uh, sectors that uh, even have receipts in uh, in uh, in local currency, there are um, there are ways in which the foreign currency exposure is mitigated. Uh, you know, through pricing, um, through indexation, uh, etc. So uh, through the the legal agreements that will govern uh, such uh, such concessions, uh, but those are second level. And uh, you rather have your receipts directly in foreign currency mm -hmm. than uh, than rely on the fact that okay you can index your price 
to the dollar. And of course, we know that uh, pricing infrastructure is also highly politically sensitive. So you cannot just say, I want to increase the price of power because, uh, you know, uh, I'm a private investor. Mm -hmm. Or I want to increase the price on the toll road with that. So you need long government approval processes, etc. Mm -hmm. So if you can prevent, if you can walk away from that, you also want to walk away from that. So we have, um, I would say, you know, if you are ranking, uh, look at those infrastructure assets that have the ability to generate foreign currency to mm -hmm. mitigate your foreign currency exposure. And when you are going to those assets that don't directly generate uh, foreign currency, you use your uh, financing agreements and the concession agreement with the government to see how you can mitigate uh, the foreign currency exposure in your infrastructure uh, investments. Excellent. Thank you Thank so you. much, Tyro. Um, we're really precious for time, but I think we'll have some questions. I'll quickly look in the in the Q&A chat room and see. We have a question. I'm not sure if it's for this panel, but I'm going to ask it anyway. From um, Masood, do Nigeria's um, numerous economic zones provide regulatory relief and foreign currency facilitation to foreign direct investment. I think, I'm not sure if that was answered before. Um, Tai, will you want to answer that? Uh, it, it, um, it's uh, the, the economic zones, the- Yes. What the, the question of providing the, relief and regulatory relief and foreign currency facilitation. I'm not sure well, if that um, was answered. I, I, I I think I think uh, listening to the last part of the uh, mm. of the of the last session, I think the lady. Used I think to be I think you and they answered that. Uh, there's there's, there's another that. one. There's another one that you can answer. Actually, what kind of infrastructure projects would the private equity investment be appropriate or feasible for, considering the typical lifespan securities of for banks or real estate? So that's a question you can answer. Uh, can you come again? What type of uh, infrastructure? What asset? type? So what type of um one minute? Oh, I just got a, what type of um one minute? Oh, I just saw that now. What type of uh, infrastructure projects would you advise uh, private equity investors to to go into to focus on? Yeah, I mean the it's 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 um, the the response will be similar to what I just spoke about. Uh, if you're a mm -hmm. private equity uh, investor, um, I mean usually uh, one um, uh, for most private equity investors, and you have your you have your uh, limited partners and your uh, your own investors coming outside the country, you want to protect them against uh, currency devaluation. You want to protect them against diminution in, their, in the value of their investments. So as much as possible, you want to uh, invest in infrastructure assets. You want to invest in infrastructure assets that mitigate uh, foreign currency. And I, I spoke about infrastructure assets that have the ability to generate uh, US dollars, uh, airports, seaports, uh, et cetera. Um, so that is one. And two, you also, as a private equity investor, because again, private equity investors are usually um, time, uh, time bound. Uh, they are not, uh, they use, they have uh, funds and the funds usually have a specific lifespan that they need to exit, etc. So you are also looking at an infrastructure uh, asset that you can, uh, you know, sell off. That is, there is a kind of a secondary market for that uh, infrastructure uh, infrastructure asset. And uh, the type of uh, investment that I spoke about, um, you know, therefore, if you if you are able to develop an airport, uh, I'm sure. You will. I mean, if it's uh, if you if you develop it very well, the the secondary value you will have investors coming in uh, after that the, uh, airport has been built to take it off you, and then sit with the um the revenues that will come over the next twenty or thirty years. 
So um, those are those are the kind of advice that uh, I will give uh, private equity investors. Very quickly for two of you, Shoma will be asked a, an interesting question on the corruption issue and says that uh, that's a limiting issue for infrastructure and how, how can that be, be mitigated? Any ideas, Shuren, Tyro? Uh, the corruption issue, and I mean, uh, in, in all that I said, I, I was talking about uh, the fact that there needs to be, the rules have to be very clear. Um, the the and if the rules are very clear, then that reduces the uh, the chances of corruption. I also mentioned that the government uh, needs to be involved at the early stages of the infrastructure development and uh, the project development stages. The project development stages is where you do the permitting, and usually a lot of corruption happens in permitting. You know, you are getting regulatory approval. You are getting mm -hmm. licenses. You are getting, uh, you know, uh, EIA certification, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The government can actually take the load for those phases, uh, the permitting process, etc., of the private investor, and therefore reduce the uh, the possibility of corrupting the process. And once that um, that uh, part of the development has been sorted out. And there is now a question of raising the financing, managing the construction, et cetera, et cetera. That can be fully left to the private investor to manage. Sure. Just to, yes, just to add to that, I think uh, Taro has explained it explicit, explicitly. Uh, that is the importance of the PP, uh, public private partnership. So the government is not in the business of doing business government is in the business of bringing private investors into the country and having a PPP. So the role of the government uh, is is laid down, what they do, the facilitation in terms of security, in terms of land, and the private entity takes the lead or the entities take the lead uh, in executing the project. So once this PPP structure is properly construct, constructed, constructed and agreed and signed, uh, that government support facilitation with the, with the private entity lowers the opportunities or mitigates a lot of corruption. So I would say that would be a way to mitigate most of the corruption. And this is one of the reasons and we are implementing it very successfully across. Thank you so much. And on that note, we'll have to bring this to an end. I want to say really, really grateful I, and big thank you to Taiwo and Shireen. It's been really engaging and um, we are really happy that you were able to join us today and to share your invaluable insights into the topic. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone. Thank you thank for you. your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you to the previous session. Um, thank you for the different perspectives shared on the previous panel and the insights that would definitely assist investors looking to invest in this sector. Um, next up is the keynote address on the political and economic overview in Nigeria. The keynote address will be delivered by Dr. Yemi Kale. 
Dr. Yemi Kale is a seasoned professional with over 23 years experience across both the private and public sectors. He has multidisciplinary expertise in data collection and analysis, asset management, project planning and management, microeconomic analysis and policy advisory and investment banking. He has served as a special advisor to the Honorable Minister of Finance. He has also he was also appointed as a technical advisor to the Federal Minister of National Planning at the National Planning Commission in Abuja. Dr. Yemi graduated with a first class degree in economics from the Addis Ababa University, Ethiopia. He holds an MSc and a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics and Political Science in the United Kingdom. Dr. Yemi Kale is currently a partner and chief economist at KPMG in Nigeria. You're welcome, Dr. Yemi. I think that we've lost Dr. Yemi. Um, we'll just um, wait for an interval video to be played in the meantime. Okay, I believe we have um, technical difficulties. So we'll just move over to the third and final panel, themed investing in the capital market and fintech space. This session will explore prospects and key factors to consider in investing in this space. The session will be moderated by Mr. Oludare Shembore. Mr. Shembore is a partner in the firm's banking and finance team. He's also the head of the firm's power team. He has over 22 years experience in advising on international projects and corporate finance transactions. He has advised on matters such as syndicated lending projects, infrastructure finance, structured trade finance, and foreign investments. He's joined by two panelists, Mr. Luwa Shewo Afolabi and Dr. Ajibola Asolo. Mr. Luwa Shewo, of Afolabi is the Vice President and Divisional Head Market Architecture at FMDQ Securities Exchange Limited. He's responsible for product and market develop development initiatives at FMDQ Markets. The second panelist is Dr. Ajibola Solo. Dr. Solo is a partner in the firm's merger and acquisition and capital market practice group. He also heads the firm's fintech and startup practice. He's a seasoned financial market expert with a wealth of experience in capital markets across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Ajibola was previously a group with group head and legal company secretary at FMDQ Group. Over to you, Doc, Mr. Shebori. Thank you very much, Toji. Um, thank you everybody for your patience and staying with us so far. Um, I'm going to be trying very quick with our session because we're still hoping to finish by 1 p.m. today. Um, on to this session, we have um, 
Chill and Ajibola with us, um, talking about capital markets and fintech. Um, Shil, I would like to pose the first questions to you and basically just ask that um, the key focus of our sessions today have been looking at foreign investors and investors and the opportunities in investing in Nigeria. And um, I'd like to ask you, that from, an, from an investor perspective, how do you see FMDQ Securities Exchange Limited creating a platform that attracts listings and enhances market competitiveness for Nigerian um, securities? Very much, Mr. Sembora, and um, good afternoon to everyone. I think I can probably say everyone is an afternoon now <laughs> across um, where um, um, our participants and attendees are have joined us from. Um, but again, um, thank you for having me. Um, so I think um, to speak to the specifics um, uh, of your question. Um, FMDQ essentially as an exchange would always. Um, factor in certain critical things, which are very, very um, important to efficiency in financial markets. Um, one of them being, you know, transparency, another one being price discovery, another one, other ancillary things being providing access to the markets. And then you can then um, layer on top of that product market development, i.e. the breadth of products that you have in the market and who, what segment of that market that those products appeal to in terms of um, supporting and facilitate, facilitating investors' uh, activity in the market. Um, if, I, if I'm allowed to uh, take you back a bit, um, just so you get a full appreciation of what FMDQ does. Um, we do not only see ourselves as a market, um, as a securities exchange, which often entails market organization and, you know, providing some form of governance in financial markets. Um, we oftentimes also see ourselves as financial markets diplomats um, and also advisors to government and regulators. And all of these things mean that we can provide a holistic experience for people who participate in our market. We can go to the government and regulators and talk about what needs to happen for the markets to be more attractive to investors. On our own end, so we can put together things that improve efficiency in the market. So either we're providing additional liquidity or we are facilitating um, improved price discovery and transparency in the market. Um, years back, if I, if I can help you understand that a bit more, um, at FMDQ, we, we, we did approach the SEC. And again, at that point in time, we had seen that the regulatory environment in Nigeria had actually a gap between what you know as one-year instruments and three-year instruments because your bonds today in Nigerian financial markets are aged three years and above, while your short term in the market, which is money market, most people means one year and below. Um, we did approach the SEC and told them, look, there's a gap here in people who want funding for one to three years without needing to roll over one year instruments or go borrow more than what you need. It's leading to, you know, funding mismatch. And together with the SEC, we did introduce something called short term bonds in the Nigerian financial market. And again, that essentially allows certain people to come to the market, get the kind of funding they need, um, and of course, um, expanding the products in the Nigerian financial market. Um, similarly, um, I think we have a bit of background noise. Yeah, um, similarly, somewhere. similarly um, today we have also um, been responsible for the activities you see in the Nigerian CP market um, today. Um, before 2014, um, the Nigerian CP market had essentially, um, it was probably on, on the verge of extinction because that market had, had been there pre previously, if I, if I may say, but years of, you know, um, lack of standardization, some bit of abuse in that market meant that at some point that market was literally shut down. And then, of course, we re-entered that space, of course, which worked with the central bank. We did reactivate that market. That market is essentially about one trillion naira strong um, today in terms of um, 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 funds that have been raised by businesses and enterprises in that market, which, again, is another investment avenue for um investors looking to participate in the Nigerian financial markets um, for their investment. So those are simple examples I can even take you back to historically. Going forward, one thing that we also do in the exchange, like I said earlier, is product and market development. And what does that mean? It means there's an exchange. We will sit down, we will engage, look at the market from a holistic standpoint, engage regulators, engage market participants, and see what products are needed in this market, which product 
is our market long overdue for. Um, and over the last four years, we have spent a lot of time trying to build the derivatives market in Nigeria because we know that that is the next phase that this market um, needs right now. And we did succeed in launching one um, in July this year at the exchange, um, where you know, we now have um, derivatives products that have bonds as they're on the line, as well as FX um, themselves. To sort of start you know, fixing some of the problems that, you know, you have in the FX markets um, in itself. So that's generally what we do in FMDQ and how, what we have been doing in terms of trying to, you know, facilitate access to our markets and encourage investors in, in that market. Thank you very much, um, Shem. I think um, I'd just like to also ask a second question um, around the FMDQ group. And is and I, and I think one of the key things some investors usually have is, especially when you're trying to invest in a market, is is issues around transparency, efficiency, flexibilities, right? So how does the FMDQ market infrastructure help um, to promote these um, key considerations for investors? And from a market player perspective, um, are there any specific challenges that you believe are existing in on, in order to to create that framework or um, to achieve that objective of having a market transparency, efficiency, and flexibility within the market. Yeah, that's, that's thanks again, um, Mr. Shambo. That's a very loaded question. Yeah. Um, on one side, I think I think of market transparency essentially as being able um having access to baseline information for you to be able to make investment decisions, right? Um, and Around the concept of market transparency, three things are very important here. Yeah? Price discovery, um, access to data. And the third one being something like, I, I, I routinely call it benchmark administration, right? Um, all of these three things are very important to market transparency. Um, price discovery is people being able to see what assets or securities or instruments are trading at for them to make any investment decision as it affects or relates to them. Um, of course, um, data is a bigger uh, pool of information, whether fundamental information, whether technical information around securities that, again, facilitate and aids the investment decision process. And of course, benchmark administration, which means that that information that you're all consuming, what is the integrity of that information, right? Um, and again, today, if you look at what we do in FMDQ, um, we tend to cater to all of that in one form or the other. So um, today you would find, you know, information on price of security in public forums, like on TV stations, um, rolling as a ticker there, you will find it on our website and you will find it on, on various sources. Um, Additional or more intricate information, of course, is available via data portal that we avail to um, people in the market. And then, of course, in terms of benchmark administration, today in Nigeria, we're probably the we are probably the, one of the biggest benchmark administrators. We administer NAFEX, which is the exchange rates benchmark that everybody in this market uses today. We administer NITI, which is a treasury bill benchmark. We administer NIBO as well um, today. Um, and all of that means is that people know how all of these benchmarks are computed and they can begin to you know assess the level of integrity in there and we don't just do that all of the methodologies uh, for which all of these things are calculated are published on our website for people to consume and engage us as well as um, trying to understand and developing their own insight and knowledge about all of these things so all these three points again are what again make a market more or less transparent um if, if you get me and transparency begets um efficiency of markets because when there's price discovery, there's transparency, then people can price instruments and assets in that market as efficiently as possible. They can incorporate any new information into whatever decisions they are making to influence the price of security, which is what market efficiency is all about, right? And finally is flexibility. Flexibility for me is really in and around access to market itself, right? How do people currently come into the markets to do whatever activity they want to do? And once you go to access, then you begin to look at things like what is investor segment is currently um, has a bit more difficulty accessing the markets today. What kind of securities can they access? And some of those intricacies there. Uh, if I, if, I mean, from an FMDQ standpoint, I think one area that we have always looked at again and has become part of things that we plan to look on going for that is you know, retail investors and how they participate in the broader fixed income and currency markets. The derivatives market we launched is going to be a useful one um, because, again, we do have a lot of 
products in the pipeline that we think are going to be very useful for retail investors in the market. And again, these are products that are designed around even people's behavior in terms of how they you know pursue investments and, and assess investments. Um, so that is one, one thing that we'll do. Assess again means, you know, again, we all often have to remember that the financial markets can be a bit regulated sometimes. So you still have to do that within the ambit of regulations uh, as well. So which then takes me to your question around challenges. With all of that, I said, you will probably be able to discern from my, from my submission that a critical thing might be um, regulations, right? Um, and I did hear one of the speakers at one of the panel earlier talk about, you know, regulations, dealing with multiple regulations and not knowing what regulations exist. Um, maybe from my own end uh, as an exchange, I wouldn't, maybe I don't share the entire sentiment because personally, I don't even have a choice. I have to be abreast of what new regulations are out there as well as the capital markets, financial markets are concerned. But I think there's greater room for regulatory collaboration, actually. Um, and what that means is that it opens us up into a world of importance, right? Today in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, when you take out South African market, Nigeria is probably the biggest market that you find, right? And the way we see it in FMDQ is that it is we have to become the next regional, big regional financial center in, 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 in Sub-Saharan Africa. And our market is big on its own, but again, we are right in the middle of a region where we can through regulatory collaboration, harmonizing rules and regulation across country become that financial hub in this axis. We literally need to become the London of, of this sub-Saharan Africa or the Singapore of, of sub-Saharan Africa, where people as far as Senegal, Gambia, can come to Nigeria, raise capital, and again, um, facilitate all the activities around their um, investment value chain in, across the country. So one thing that jumps out of mind is regulatory collaborations as a challenge uh, to that. I must state that there have been a lot of activities going on in terms of curing that. You know that there's the um, West African um, forum where the regulators are trying to harmonize rules. But again, as is the usual thing with Nigeria, um, things don't often move as quickly as they should um, for you to get the benefit that you want to, eat, um, to get from that initiative. So again, um, it, we, we keep encouraging everyone, all the stakeholders, the regulators, even ourselves, um, again, because oftentimes those people also need support from market participants like ourselves and other stakeholders. And that is the point where things then get lost because they don't get the support they need then they proceed on their own um, um, trajectory and do stuff and then it becomes substandard and then we're all back at square one and all of that. So that's perhaps one, one major challenge. I would have said technology, but again, um, technology in Nigeria is probably a bit more um, advanced than other places. I mean, it's no it's no mean feat that Nigeria probably attracts one of the largest amount of um, um, venture capital investments in technology today. So um, I don't think technology is a problem problem, um, but it is about putting all the domino pieces in the right um, order and in line for us to get the kind of benefits that we want. So that's one that jumps out at me, um, regulatory um, improvement and collaboration. Thank you, Shay. I think um, we'll probably reach out to you to see how we can collaborate with you to work on the um, regulatory challenges to, to see what we can do to work together to, to resolve those challenges. And um, on the point which um, Shu talked about, about technology and Nigeria attracting um, some of the largest venture capital funding within the technology space, I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you see the current economic and geopolitical, geopolitical climate and trends that you see shaping the future of investments in the fintech space in Africa and particularly Nigeria? Thank you, Barry. Yeah, so, so the... The fintech industry in Nigeria, and particularly, or in Africa, and particularly Nigeria, has witnessed a lot of growth and evolution in the last five to ten years. And obviously, for going forward as well, we'll, we'll see even more, even more growth and activity. Obviously, a caveat to start with is that you know because a new government is only just coming to place, and they, they're trying to find their rhythm. So it's you know it'll be difficult to kind of read where things. Things will land, but some things, some things are, are very clear along various touch points within the value chain. Um, and I'll just touch on them um, one after the other. And the first I'll talk about will be digital payments and, and remittances. So in, in Nigeria and on the continent, we've seen a rapid adoption of digital payment solutions. Um, 
you know, money, mobile money has mobile money and peer-to-peer -peer payment platforms have arisen and essentially changed the dynamic as to how you know payments and transfers and remittances are made um, for going forward and given our challenges in the contract at the moment with, with FX is entirely conceivable indeed. Um, I, I guess you can take it to the bank, they're probably going to see more activity in that space, digital payments and rem remittances. Another touch point to be financial inclusion. Um, fintech companies on the continent and in Nigeria you know, played a crucial role in just helping to drive this, this, this notion of financial inclusion, helping to serve, helping to essentially move financial services to unbanked populations, um, you know, helping, helping to build savings, credit, insurance infra infrastructure and things of that nature. It's entirely conceivable, again, that in this area, we're going to see more activity going forward and more investment. Um, a third point would be blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, we know we know about these things. Um, Bitcoin and Ethereum um, is gaining traction across the continent. Um, but Nigeria is Nigeria has shown particular interest in cryptocurrencies. Um, even though, admittedly, at the moment, um, there's regulatory uncertainty, and, and that is in itself a challenge. But I think it's safe to say that going forward, um, with the challenges in the FX space, with the difficulty moving moving between currencies, it's it's considerable and and quite frankly, you can take it to the bank as well. That there will be more activity in that space. Um, another another point to be lending and credit scoring. Um, a lot of these fintech entities um, are basically democratized lending and and also this notion of credit scoring. Um, we have platforms today that, that essentially do credit that build credit score credit score systems on the on the basis of of social media information. Um, it's expected with our population on the continent and in our country specifically, it's expected that there will be more activity in this space as well and investment as well. Um, a fifth point of our point would be insurance, right? Um, so InsurTech, this is an entire subset of insurance that is just arising we're seeing activity where, where young bodied entrepreneurs are basically helping to develop affordable, innovative insurance products that are extending um, to either to underserved populations. Um, so for going forward, entities that you know that can be efficient with claim processing frameworks and mechanisms and taking this into taking this to a micro level, uh, we'll see, we'll see um, you know, we'll see activity in that space as well. A six point will be partnerships and collaboration. Um, we see We've seen um, in the last five years partnerships between um, fintech entities and tra traditional financial institutions. Um, so fintech entities leverage, um, you know, the, the framework, the infrastructure, the customer base of of um, you know the traditional banks and, and traditional FIs, whilst the banks leverage the um, just the nimbleness and the innovative quality of of fintech entities. Um, it's entirely expected that we'll see more activity in this space again going forward. So even though the broader VC even though the broader VC space has been a bit measured in the last in the last year, um, it's expected that in, in, in that area, you know, partnerships and collaborations will see will see more activity. And a final point out I'll point to where we'll see more activity will be cybersecurity and fraud prevention. Um, we see that you know we a lot of the financial services activities have moved online now. And so cybersecurity is a big deal. We see that it's something that the CBN takes very seriously. Um, and we also hear that on the tort side, um, where we see you know big big DMBs, deposit money banks that are the victim of fraud, right? So this particular area is something that we'll see more activity um, in going forward, whether it be from just de developing propositions as to how to cure, stem and prevent cybersecurity, and whether it be you know, the right the rise of right regulation in this area. Um, those are those are you know broadly speaking areas in the fintech VC space where we think that we'll see uh, activity for going forward. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, James. I think the last question I'd like to pose to you, and it, it stems from the fact that there is Nigeria has such a huge it's reported that there's such a huge um fintech space in Nigeria, several unicorns. Um, the investment within the fintech space in Nigeria has been significant. Do you still see rooms or opportunities for, for fintechs in Nigeria, especially within the remittances, payments, and digital banking services 
in Nigeria? Are there room for more investors to play in there? And what's the impact fintechs can have in this in this space of the economy? Yeah, thanks a lot, Dari. Um, broadly speaking, when it comes to remittance, um, I think I'll take it from two perspectives. Um, you know, where we've come from and, and where we're going to, and then the negative and positive side of, of things. So for, for, for remittances, I think that in terms of what we've seen, um, the activity of of some of these players on platforms has been very admirable. So to start with, fundamentally, they've they've helped they've helped reduce transaction costs, right? Um, so the cost of sending and receiving remittances is dramatically reduced now. Um, solutions solutions where you can download apps on Google Play Store or wherever it be the iStore and essentially have to do a bit of KYC, you can begin to move money around. Um, um, so that is clearly a good thing for going forward. Um, to kind of answer the question directly for moving forward, yes, it's, you know, as I said earlier, even if the market is measured at the moment, we do think that there will be more activity there because the population is huge. Um, there's a lot of poverty on the continent. So just moving, moving money to where it needs to get to will mean that you know, there'll be remittance activities for going forward. Um, so we do expect that there'll be activity there. Another point would be convenience. Um, as I said earlier, um, you know, as a potential remittance space, um, there's a huge diaspora population abroad that can now move money to their family members on the continent and in Nigeria specifically. And uh, that is that is a good thing. Again, we will see more of that for going forward. And then it, finally, competition. There are a whole host of displayers um, who create different products on different platforms and that kind of drives competition and drives efficiency, leading to you know better outcomes for financial service consumers, you know, fast, faster transfers and even more competitive exchange rates. Um, there's also been negative impacts as well. Um, and for going forward, as people, as participants in the ecosystem, as legal advisors or as a law firm, um, we we try to you know do thought leadership and contribute to the process of curing some of these defects. But I'll just talk about some of them very quickly. Um, one would be regulatory challenges. I think from a regulatory perspective, um, the, the apex financial market regulator here, i.e. you know, the CBN on the financial market side and then the SEC on the on the capital market side like, are still grappling with how to shape and design regulation um, for not just the remittance space, for just the financial services space broadly. Um, so you know the question is the heart of the question is. Um, how do you regulate these entities? You know, our financial market regulators are used to regulating them um, from a financial stability perspective. Uh, you know, with, with an emphasis on capital and the appropriateness of the appropriateness of capital, the size of capital, um, branches, things like that. Um, that mindset needs to needs to change. Um, so we need to we need to regulate our regulatory posture towards these fintech entities um, needs to be much more conciliatory. Um, with the objective of innovation in mind. And then there are also other challenges that some of which I alluded to earlier, there's, there's cybersecurity concerns. Um, you know, there's a lot of fraud that happens in, in that space, not just in the remittance space, but just in, in the money flows across the financial services space um, as it pertains to FinTech. Um, and then there's infrastructure and connectivity issues as well. Um, the reality is, um, the, the large swathes of the population that are rural. So getting service, even though a lot of work has been done, um, still getting services and effecting remittances across, you know, you know, to, to get into these um, rural areas is, remains a bit of a challenge. Um, but again, um, it's not all doom and gloom. There are there are measures that have been measures that have been put in place to cure some of these issues. Um, probably an example is the we just signed the Data Protection Act. Um, so, so, which ensure, which basically sees, sees, is to see to it that you know there is there's fidelity as to how consumers' data, or the data of consumers are used and things of that nature. So it's a it's a whole bucket of issues. Um, but to, to kind of stay focused on your question, um, as it pertains to remittance, um, yes, there's been a lot of activity. I outlined some of them, um, and for going forward, there will remain. There's going to be investment in that space just because of the, the sheer size of the population and the sheer the sheer size of the fact was 
simple fact that a lot of the population remains underserved. I think I'll just stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Jibs. Um, I think um, thanks, Ajibla. I think um, we don't have any questions from the audience, and if anybody has any questions, please post them in the Q and A. Um, we still have the panelists with us. Um, Shimo, I'd like to ask you to just very, very quickly, if you just give us a snapshot of what you think are the opportunities for foreign investors within the um, Nigerian capital markets currently and in the next couple of years. Um, and that will be all from this panel. Thanks, Shimo. Thank you very much. Um... Maybe I'll extend it a bit to just no capital markets. Again, forgive me, I, I, can, I can be a bit of a purist in that regard because capital markets speaks to bonds. And um, most investors you would come across already have to grapple with a few things, right? Um, one, either the, the returns on, 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 on investment, I mean, securities in the markets today are, do not compensate well enough. Or even if they're there, um, the, the liquidity problems that affect those securities. Um, again, you've seen what's happening in the equities market, although there's been a rally very quickly after the new administration came into uh, power uh, on the back of some sentiments and, and um, you know, expectations around, you know, new policies and all of that. But you see that has began to fizzle out very quickly. Um, it's not also helpful that um, over the last seven years or so, the amount of um, um, securities Listed companies on the equity space has declined. Um, at the peak, we had about one one seventy in twenty sixteen, if I remember correctly. Today we're down to one fifty seven. Um, so again, and if you layer that on top of the fact that the top ten companies by market cap essentially account for seventy eight percent of the total market cap of the company, which means that is where all the activity is. Um, so again, um, people will continue to look for those. Um, you know investments um, um opportunities in the equity space around companies that are you know can you know survive these macroeconomic conditions that we are finding i.e can they pass through the inflationary pressures they're going in their you know products and services so those will always be it but again it'll be depressed by the level of liquidity in the market um but on the fixed income side though um you begin to grapple with things like people saying you know you don't have real return the inflation is at 26 you, you know instruments are yielding 16 percent and all of that um but the truth of it is that i think two main areas that you will find a lot of um, um invest in that investors may find joy is on the short end of the market. Um, the CP market has continued to expand and um, the yields there are a, a lot more um, rewarding um, than most people will find in the traditional treasury bills or, or um, the sovereign securities that we'll find. Um, so again, that is maybe some some space that I think you know investors will um, are beginning to you know um, find solace in, in terms of investing in pure financial markets um, um, securities. Um, of course, from the, the alternative is for people to pursue pure FDI strategies, which is direct investment in companies that have good business prospects and all of that. And like everyone has said on this panel, the go-to will be companies that are in rather defensive sectors or industries wherein, you know, their goods and services are sort of immune to, you know, the cyclicalities that some segments have, you know, it's a necessity. People must use it. People must buy and sell. So again, um, when you think about investment from that perspective, you begin to look at companies in the you know household products segments, food segments. These are things that, whether you like it or not, we can't do away with. Um, and you start looking at securities or instruments around these sectors that then become your go-to because you expect that they will be able to provide you with that balance between you know decent returns as well as you know the, the risk that you face from that investment as far as it's concerned but like i said anyone works me up today i would say maybe um you know the, the, the short end of the market in the commercial paper space is it because pretty much everyone anticipates that interest rates are going to go um up a bit more so again um you you most people do not would not want to do a long term do not want to be on the long end of the on the of the yield curve at this point in time. But again, equities will always still remain some investments. Um, of course, subject to liquidity challenges that exist in that market, like I alluded, like I alluded to earlier. Um, otherwise, you know, it's more of pursuing foreign direct investment strategies, identifying good business prospects early, getting in at very, very um, rewarding valuations and being able to, you know, take out whatever gains you make in that investments um down the line, even when. Um, the FX market would have, you know, improved on the back of new policies that, you know, the new administration would have put in to support that. So that that would be my own summary around that. Thanks, Joe. 
And just before you sign off, we have a question for you. And um, the question is, when will the derivatives market be launched? And how deep will the capacity of the market be? In terms of options, trading, swaps, et cetera, will FMDQ create a separate body for this as it's likely, and is likely requires significant monitoring? So I think you're muted, Shion. So yeah, when will the derivatives market be launched? Basically. Yeah. Yeah, I can answer that. Actually, we did launch the derivative market on July 12th this year. Um, that market has started out with um, two product types, um, bond futures, which are essentially futures contracts that have uh, sovereign bonds as the underline, and as well as another variant of FX futures, um, which essentially are futures contracts that have um, 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 the US US dollar NGN currency pairs, it's on the line. Uh, so the market has in fact started, um, but of course, as any market, you would find that things are a bit muted at the early stage of it, but the market is there. You're actually absolutely correct. Um, the derivatives market as it's been launched today is a very, very regulated market. It is under the purview of the SEC. Um, a lot of regulatory approvals had to come out from, from the SEC for that market to launch, but the market has in fact launched already. And again, there are opportunities there for um, people who you know find um, use for any of the products that is there. Um, um, for any of their you know investments um activities and 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 that as they may they may require thank you very much um and thank you for taking our time to join us show thanks for taking our time to, um for sharing your thoughts uh, Majibala. um i'll pass on the mic back to toju and goke for the last part of today's sessions thank you very much thanks for having thank me. you very much mr shimbor thank you very much um just to, we'll have um Dr. Yemi Kale to just briefly come and talk about the, um, just share his thoughts on the political and e economic landscape in Nigeria. Dr. Kale, you're um, welcome. Sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon. And, um, um, and uh, my apologies for joining late. I had several other sessions. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit, con a bit concerned. I've seen for the last half an hour, the, co the conversations we'll be having that a lot of the things I'm going to say have probably already been uh, addressed. How, so I will just generally summarize. I think we all understand uh, in terms of the political and um, uh, uh, the political and economic context, we understand that Nigeria's potential as a sound investment uh, environment is well understood. And that's, that is why even though, um, despite the macroeconomic challenges that we might have in the country, we have a situation where if investors always stay in Nigeria, and even when they leave Nigeria, uh, they're always looking in because they understand that once we get things right, it's a, it's a big market to be in. The potential of the country are well, are, are well recognized. The largest, we have a very large market, largest economy in the continent. We've heard this many times. Um, we have a large market. We have so many abundance of mini, um, uh, human and physical resources, very good, uh, good arable land, and so on. Uh, and, and the main reasons why we have not been able to attain that potential, really, it's not because we, we lack the resources. I, I classify them into three reasons. One is, um, of course, our, our reliance on oil, um, uh, political instability, unlike many other countries, particularly in, in what we refer to as the Asian Tigers. We have not really had a period of sustained economic, uh, political stability. It's always that process going in and out, uh, and uh, starting and stopping and starting all over again. Additionally, I, I, I think one of, the, one of the major reasons is also what I like to term um, on first errors. Those of you that, uh, that play tennis will understand what I, tennis will understand what I mean by that. And that's basically we, our own government, our own system, actually just taking the wrong decisions, um, doing the wrong things, adopting the wrong policy or, or adopting the right policy wrongly. And that's partly why um, one of the reasons why we're not able to achieve this potential. We don't really like to listen too much to the operators and listen to what um, stakeholders are supposed to be. Uh, and when we don't do that, unfortunately, because of that, it makes it harder for us to attain our potential. Uh, and finally, and probably more importantly, is what I like to describe as the dysfunctional structure of the Nigerian economy. And I see the Nigerian economy is structured uh, dysfunctional. And I, what I mean by that is, yes, we have a diversified economy. 
uh, with 95% of the economy non-oil and 5% just oil. But when you look at the input output table, supply use tables, you'll find that um, that 95% non-oil sector is still 58% of that is indirectly dependent on oil. So you have an economy that has 65% of it dependent significantly uh, on oil. Um, now we have a situation where the global and the domestic macroeconomic and political environment is extremely tense. Uh, is making such investor investments coming to Nigeria difficult. We've, we've seen the numbers. On the global stage, um, since 2019, the global economy has been slowing down, inflation has risen. And even though that was initially instigated by the COVID-19 pandemic, more recently, it's been sustained by a um, series of geopolitical tensions everywhere, from R Russia to Ukraine. Now we have the Israel-Palestine issue. They are constrained between for a while anyway between US and China uh, so there's just all the different uh, uh, military coups in the in the West African region so there have just been a Central Africa several tensions all about the planet. the problem with tensions is that they tend to slow economic growth uh, and with that they tend to uh, slow down also global foreign direct investment as well as domestic investment domestic investments is also tied to the purchasing power of the of, of, of the domestic markets and with higher inflation as a result of all these tensions is also affecting the willingness of um, foreign and domestic investors to play in this market. So despite the fact that the market is extremely uh, beneficial, has huge, huge returns can be made here. You can imagine with all the uh, infrastructure and other challenges we have in security and so on, Nigeria, like many companies in Nigeria are still post over the years, substantial profit. So you can imagine if you get the other things right. So that, that, that just shows you the huge potential that we have. Currently now, now we have a domestic macroeconomy that virtually in every part of the macroeconomy make um, investments um, difficult. And uh, this is the environment that the current administration has taken over. The advantage of the current administration is that it has taken, we are going back into an era of private-led, um, the private-led growth development model. Uh, uh, this is what I believe the last year, the previous administration. We moved from a period when we are growing six, seven percent and had stronger investment. Uh, that was the between 1999 and uh, 2015, I think, to a period where we were growing about one and a half years in the last eight years. And that part of that problem was what I called the first era. That was the government moved from a private sector uh, consumer expenditure led development model to a, uh, a government led development model. So, what, what government is was a squeeze private investment, squeeze consumer demand. And they took money from those two entities that account for over 80% of the economy to fund government expenditure. Now, that's, that was a bad strategy. And that's why it squeezed um, economic growth, squeezed private investment, squeezed expansion, it increased foreign direct investment. And I think that's change, which the current administration is trying to implement, moving back to private, a private sector led growth, is actually what's going to return us to the period of. Um, or faster growth and higher investment. But before then, between now and then, the short to medium term, it's gonna hurt, it's hurting. Uh, I don't expect significant investments in the short to medium term, but I think as long as the government and the political economy keeps faith with uh, with reforms, over time, you now start, see, start to see those investments coming. The advantage also is that for potential investors is things are really pretty bad. And if you're in for the long haul, this is the time to actually come in because you can come in at a, at a time when things are relatively uh, more difficult and basically wait for when things start to uh, become more profitable. The, the challenge, like I said, however, is that in the next for the next 18 months, maybe two years, uh, while there's an attempt to put things together, it's going to be very challenging. It's going to be very discouraging. There's, a, there's an atmosphere of uncertainty and uncertainty is really what keeps investment out of the way. If you look at the government's priorities, you see there are certain um, opportunities. Again, I'm not sure if many of this has been discussed. Opportunities 
based on the priority, but it is in agriculture, but it is in infrastructure development, of huge opportunities in solid minerals, huge growth potential there. And if government is serious about developing that uh, that area, the huge uh, investment opportunity in that in that in that space. I know that a lot of the last conversation has been on capital markets and so on. But I'm looking at I'm I'm looking at it more from the foreign direct investment opportunities perspective. Um, so like I said, well, the economy is significantly challenged currently, um, uh, and it's going to be that way for the, the medium to longer, to, sorry, the short to medium term. There's really nothing that can. There's no. There's no magic wand that's going to that's going to fix that. Um, we just they, they are, we just assume that the government is going to keep faith with its reforms, which have to be taken, and if those reforms are kept, uh, uh, and um, most of these macroeconomic challenges are fixed, and we have a more stable macroeconomic environment that is more conducive for for higher returns on investment, then we ha we have a We'll get to a situation where more investments are going to be flowing um, for the good of the country. So I think I will stop there. Um, again, because I'm, I, I'm suspecting that most of the things I mentioned are probably this, and I don't want to have to repeat them again. So um, thank you very much. And I'll hand over the meeting back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kale. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for sticking with us and um, for attending our events. And just to wrap up the event, we'd like to invite our founder and our of council, Mr. Benga Oyebode, to give the closing remarks. Really just, this is just to say thank you very much to all of our uh, panelists and guests who've uh, joined us today. Uh, we thank you for the, uh, the brilliant uh, conversations that have taken place through the, this morning. Uh, the ALN Roadshow being particularly uh, focused on growth of the industry, growth of uh, Nigeria, investment uh, uh, in Nigeria, but particularly also across the continent. So thank you very, very much for giving of your time uh, and your expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. On that note, thank you and um, see you next time.